The scene opens up with a newborn baby in a household. The first thing he could remember when he was born in this world was wondering why his vision was so blurry like this. The nurse informed his mother that her baby was a healthy boy, and the mother wanted to see him. She admired his beautiful green eyes because of which he really looked like his father, Abramo. His hair was also the same as hers, and he inherited the black color of the OST Empire's imperial hair. Plus, seeing how his looks were very similar to his majesty, they believed that this boy would be a good king. Meanwhile, the boy was in his own thoughts, wondering why they were talking about the king, where he was born, and above all else, why he, who was just born, not even a long time had passed, now thinking about such a thing. The mother says that from today, his name would be Raymond, and he would be the next king of Chentro Kingdom, while the boy realizes he has been reborn. After his birth, time flew really fast, and he turned three months old. In those times, there were a few things he could remember. In the beginning, he lived in Japan on Earth, and he was a Japanese citizen. He did not really know the reason, but he died. About how he lived in his previous life, he decided to leave that completely. Then, for whatever reason, he was reborn as a member of the royal family. Whereas before, even being called uncle by a child was not strange for someone of his age at the time. But right now, he was a baby with soft skin and plump cheeks. Even when his memory came back, he felt hopeless, and then after a few months, he finally gave up. However, rather than being called given up, he managed to hold that memory as just a memory. The gap between his current self and his previous life, he realizes that he was just a helpless child who still had memories of his previous life. In his previous life, until the end, he was a person with a different nature and character, so he wondered if the memories of his previous life would slowly fade away as he got older. However, because of those memories, he could not become a child, nor could he become an adult. But thanks to that difference too, he felt at ease that he was who he was. Suddenly, his mother comes in and holds him in her arms, telling him that he is the next generation king of this land while also saying that since he was her son, as the first queen from the OST empire, she won't forgive him if he lost to the son of a woman of the Duke family. Raymond, on the other hand, started to get tired as his mother, Maya, always relentlessly told him things like this. Even though he got the impression that she was a young girl, there was no doubt that she was a mature woman. From the information that he learned from this person, it seemed that he had a few brothers and sisters, and his father also had a wife other than his mother. Besides him being their younger brother, if there was no problem, he believed the crown prince should also be his brother. Even so, because of his mother's words and behavior who also recommended him as crown prince, she made the maids not want to have anything to do with him. Hold on. If you guys are loving this video, make sure to comment. We are loving it, because that is how I get to know that. Now, getting back to the story. Meanwhile, his father also cherished him a lot just like his mother. He was the king of the middle world, the current Chentro kingdom, Abramo Chentro. His father always said things like Raymond so cute and all while his mother, on the other hand, always reminded him that he would be the king. It was impossible for him to know the internal affairs of this world. But there was another person that he had met in these three months. A woman enters the room calling out to Raymond and embraces him. She was Maria, who was assigned to take care of him. She was very beautiful, and her character was also good which left him thinking that she was perfect, and he wouldn't leave her to a strange man. He really wanted her to be his bride, but their age difference was too much and on top of that, he could not propose to a woman who even changes his own diaper. However, if it was not with the man he recognizes, he would not let her be anyone's bride. Maria then tells him that as Maya said, she also feels that she wants him to choose her himself. The world was wide, filled with things he still did not know and then showing him outside the window. She says that if he keeps walking towards the south, that was the birthplace of his mother Maya, OST Empire. It was said that there were steep mountains which were very different from their Chentro kingdom. On that mountain, there was a dragon that was said to be the messenger of God, and the OST Empire built a bond with the dragon. There were also many dragon knights who could control the dragon as if it was their own pet. Raymond was surprised to see that in this world, there were actual dragons and he got very excited. Maria further explains to him that dragons were very virtuous beings. They would only keep one partner in their lifetime, and therefore, a married couple who were on good terms would be called a dragon couple. Dragons were very loyal, even if their mate was gone. The dragon that was still alive would die soon too. Plus, a dragon was also called the ancestor of the reptile group of the United Kingdom of Nodos. Once again, Raymond was amazed to hear creatures like dragonoid lizardmen also exist in this world, 
and seeing that he was interested in the reptile group, Maria then decides to tell him about the United Kingdom of Nodos. She takes him out of the room which was, in fact, the first time he came out of his room since he was born. His mother often disappeared from his room to do what she should do as a king's wife, and his father himself coming to his room alone was a very rare thing. Maria, who was always worried about him, usually did not take him out either, however, in the end, today was his debut day outside, and he was beyond excited. The room he had always been in since the beginning, the decoration and the furniture were like medieval European style. However, as soon as he stepped out into the hallway, he felt like he was in medieval Europe. Just then, a knight comes up to Maria and greets her. She thanks him for his hard work and explains that she believes it is time to show the outside world to Raymond. The knight responds that it's a good thing and asks if he could accompany them. She agrees and says that if he were to accompany them, she would also feel at ease. Meanwhile, Raymond notices that Cyril has a tail and then Cyril contacts someone without any equipment and reports that since Maria was taking Raymond to walk inside the palace, he would be the one to protect her while also requesting a soldier from the escort in Maya's room. Raymond, on the other hand, was amazed to see that he just contacted someone without any equipment and wondered if it was some type of mysterious magic. He then starts babbling to Maria, and she asks him what's wrong. She realizes that he must feel weird on Madden, and Cyril also states that he must have never seen Madden before. So, he takes off his helmet and shows him a magical stone hanging from his ear. That thing was called Madden. By embedding a special technique into the magic stone like this, and channeling magic power into it, it was possible to communicate with the interlocutor in a certain place. A magic stone that allows communication with magic powers was called a magic transmission device, and its common name was Madden. Raymond tries to use it himself which surprised Cyril quite a bit, seeing how smart he was. Maria also agrees that he was indeed very smart since he always responds as if he knows what they were talking about. She then tells Raymond that Cyril was also from the United Kingdom of Nodos, and he starts to think that considering both the story about the reptile group as well as the story about Cyril, could it be possible that the United Kingdom of Nodos was the country where all the demi-humans gather? Cyril asks if his majesty was interested in the United Kingdom of Nodos, and Maria confirms, explaining that when she was talking about the dragons living in the OST empire, he was very happy and even after talking about the reptile group, he showed some interest in it. Understanding the situation a bit better, Cyril decides to introduce himself one more time. He takes Raymond's hand and kisses it. He thinks to himself that if it was not for Cyril, he would be annoyed right now but because it was related to this cat, which he felt was the exact opposite. Even as a man, he was amazed by it, and he suddenly looked so cool. He immediately decides to call him his spirit teacher and aims to become a great gentleman just like him. Cyril then asks Maria where she was heading to, and she says she was thinking of going to the courtyard near Sophia's. From Mrs. May's room, only the east side of the courtyard could be seen, but from the south side of the courtyard, even though the shadow of the United Kingdom of Nodos could not be seen, they could feel an almost similar atmosphere. Cyril also agrees and states that due to the considerable distance from the Chentro Kingdom, even the shadow of a thousand-year-old tree could not be seen. However, the atmosphere in the courtyard was similar to the place where he was born. Having said that, Maria further tells him that even though Maya said she wanted to make Raymond the crown prince, she wanted him to decide for himself. Not only the center of this country, but throughout the east, west, south, and north of the entire country, she wanted him to know other races too. Cyril also agreed and commented that that feeling of hers was just like a mother. He mentions that the heir to the throne of this land was basically according to the birth order so there was no need to provoke some unnecessary strife. Besides, if he were to become the crown prince, then the rest of the heirs would be out of control. Just then, Raymond grabs both of them, and in his mind, he says that he wanted both of them to calm down as he had absolutely no intention of doing troublesome things like the dispute over the position of the crown prince. However, he wondered how many brothers he actually had. All of a sudden, he gets all excited and starts jumping around while Maria and Cyril, who knew it was dangerous for him to do that, they both try to calm him down but they both end up hugging each other while Raymond stays in the middle. They both get a bit embarrassed, and seeing how the two of them get along, he started to wonder if they were getting married or something and if so, shouldn't he support them completely? Meanwhile, another boy comes in, and he notices the baby in Maria's arms. Raymond greets him in his baby way, and the boy was overjoyed to see how cute he was. He starts playing with him and asks Maria if he was her baby, but she briefs the boy that he was Maya's son and, in fact, 
his younger brother. Giancarlo was surprised to see that Raymond was actually his younger brother since he thought that it was just a lie told by John. However, he did, in fact, have a little brother now. Raymond, on the other hand, understood that the boy in front of him was one of his brothers, but he did not know who he was calling John. Giancarlo then introduces himself, and he was left thinking that his big brother's face was actually handsome, even though he was not a Shota Khan, because he was so cute, realizing that he would be a Shota was unavoidable. Giancarlo then cutely tells him that he can call him Giant, and as a matter of fact, no one could call him by that name other than John, but Raymond was special to him. Realizing that it was his first time coming into this yard, Giant decides to guide him too. Cyril asks him if he shall carry him too since Raymond was being carried by Maria, and Giant requests him to do that. Later, as they took a walk in the courtyard, Maria points out a glittering object and explains to him that it was the Dragon Ball, and then there was the Ruiraju. Because of its shape as if holding a jewel ball, it was called the Dragon Ball. In other words, the Dragon Ball treasure. Then because the tears that flow from the tree look like a waterfall, hence it was called Ruru. Each one used the language of the Notos. Dragon Ball was Pasgiros, and the waterfall tree of the tears was called Hulan. Giant adds on that his mother was also called an elf and that the south was said to be much more beautiful than here. So, he asks Raymond if he would like to go out with him someday. And he, on the other hand, understood why his big brother was so pretty. Speaking of which, he then notices that his ears were, in fact, a little pointy. However, he believed that it could also be said to be the standard of his fantasy gate as he met an elf. If there really was a beautiful woman who has a face similar to his brother, he guessed that she must be really pretty and hence, he really wanted to meet her, even once. Just then, something catches Giant's eyes, so he asks Cyril to put him down. There were a bunch of flowers in front of them, so he picks one and puts it on Raymond's ear. Those were the red antares flower which meant I have always liked you, and he wanted to give it to him. Maria adds that the antares flower in this country was also called crystal stone flower, and because the growth process was so beautiful, she suggests letting it grow in their room. Raymond got really happy, and Giant then kissed him on the forehead, saying that even though he did not have a strong body like John, but because he was his older brother, he would always protect him. Having said that, since the wind was getting colder, he suggested Maria take Ray back to his room while he wanted to stay there for a while. Maria takes her leave, and they say bye to each other. However, as soon as they left, fatigue got to Giant, and he started trembling. Another boy came out from the woods looking for him, but he found Giant laying on the ground. He tries to wake him up and asks him what happened, and he tells John that he was fine. Since he was able to meet his little brother, he just got really excited. But John, on the other hand, was furious after hearing about the seventh prince and was not going to accept him no matter what. Some time has passed, and the next scene opens up in the mansion where Maria was looking for Raymond. She kept calling him out and wondered if she had raised him as a bad boy while he hid in the closet. He jumps up on her from behind and scares her but then also apologizes to her for it. She tells him that his joke was too much and he kept laughing. However, putting that aside, today was the day he was going out to play with Giancarlo, so she asked him to get ready. Five years had passed since the time he met his brother Giant for the first time. He still communicated with him but not with the other brothers. What he found out in the past five years was that he was the seventh prince of this royal family. The first thing that occurred to him after hearing that news was, what should I do as the seventh prince? And that's it. Even though his mother kept saying that he has to be the king of this kingdom, he had no intention of becoming a king, even though he knew the names of his other brothers, because he never had any sort of communication with them. He only knew about Giancarlo's face. His brothers Frederick and Orland were sons of the first consort Karina, while brothers Bertrand and Andrea were the sons of the second consort Anastasia. Then, lastly, his brothers Giant and Giovanni were the sons of the third consort, Sophia. The reason why he did not communicate with his other siblings was because his mother, who kept insisting that he would be the crown prince one day, treated him very carefully in the palace, and since he was pretty young, he could not go out by himself. Even when playing with his brother Giant, he could only be in his room or in the eastern garden. But now, Maria finally said that it was time for him to come out without any problems. His big brother Giant had held a birthday party for him, and apart from that, he also threw a tea party too. Just thinking about the southern park made him excited because he really liked it, as it was just like a fantasy world. Just then Cyril enters the room, who had come to pick him up. He addresses him as a teacher and was ready to go out while thinking that finally, starting from today, he could go where he wanted to go. He finally arrives where Giant was waiting for him, and they share a warm hug. 
However, all of a sudden, Jayan starts coughing intensely. Ray asks him if he's okay, and he assures him that he was fine. But he thinks to himself that when he met him the first time, he said that his body was weak. However, lately, the effect was often seen as he coughed so hard. In his previous life, since he was a doctor, he would have tried looking for a cure. But this was not a disease but the condition of his body itself was like that. A child born from parents who were not of the same race, in general, was bound to have a certain problem. If only he could determine the cause of the condition. He believed his name would surely be written down in history as an invention. Giant apologizes to him for surprising him out of nowhere, but he then shifts the topic and asks him if he wanted to see the drawings he made, to which he excitedly replies that, of course, he wants to. Jayan used to rarely go outside and instead, he often drew. So, all of them were beautiful paintings drawn with a gentle touch. He then asks Cyril and Maria to stay outside because from there on out, it was his secret route, and he wanted to show it only to Ray. They both listened to him since the southern part of the garden had already been prepared with protection magic, and they tell him to call them if anything happened. And so, the two of them start walking through the garden. However, Raymond accidentally steps on a flower and crushes it, which makes him a bit sad. Giant asks him if he really likes those Antro's flowers, to which he replies that he does since he gave it to him for the first time. Giant, on the other hand, was surprised to see that he remembers things that happened when he was a baby, and Raymond started panicking, thinking that if he knew he could remember things from that long ago, he would be considered creepy and weird. However, Jayan did not seem to care as he was simply glad to hear that and he further asks him if he remembers anything else that he said that day. Raymond asks if he was going to give him something, and he takes his hand and then takes him somewhere. They arrived in front of a huge tree, and Raymond was stunned to see such an amazing view. As they walked towards the bench, it turns out John was also there, and he finally understood why Jayan was secretly preparing things. It's because he made a promise to meet someone. Giant questions him why he was here, and in response, he points at Raymond and says that even though he was the seventh prince, he wanted to become the crown prince, however, he must know his place. Raymond understands that the boy in front of him was Sophia's son, just like Giant and also his brother, the fifth prince, Giovanni Centro. Giant tries to defend him and says that just like Maya said, it has nothing to do with him. But John questions if there was a way to really prove that and plus, how does he know that he does not really want the position of the crown prince? Jayan tells him that he cannot exactly prove it, but the ray he knew would not do such a thing. John argues that he was just using him because he was Maya's son, but Jayan replies that he would not do that kind of thing because he was their little brother. However, John states that to him, Raymond was just another blood-related person but he was the only one precious to him. Ray, on the other hand, really liked being protected, however, he did not like it when his two big brothers have to fight each other, so he timidly calls out Giant, and he assures him that he was not wrong and that he would protect him but all of a sudden, he starts coughing again. Frustrated, John pushes Raymond back and tells him that it was all his fault as Giant always pushed himself all because of him. He was frozen and started to think that this year, his brother Giovanni should be 14 years old. If he would have been in Japan, then he would be a middle school student now, but he was still very young. He understood very well how painful Giovanni's feelings were because for him, his little brother Giant was the only closest brother to him. Because of his body condition, he was always by his side as he kept locking himself in the room and surely he always took care of his feelings too. So, Raymond tells him that at the entrance of the garden, they were Maria and Cyril and requests him to call them while thinking that rather than the five-year-old him having to go, he who was 14 years old would be able to go faster to call someone else. John questions him if he wants to be alone with Giant, and he replies that there's nothing else they could do. However, John accuses him that he must have said something like that because he was planning to harm Giant while he was away from him. But he was not going to let that happen and was determined to protect his little brother. Furious, Raymond says to him that he was being stupid and if he did not want to call them, then he would just call them by himself. If he could not do anything for Giant, he tells him to better just stay there and he heads out. He thinks to himself that there's no way he would ever endanger Giant. John never knew how close the two of them were usually and just because they were the children of the same mother, he was denying his true feelings for Giant and for that, he was really angry at him. However, with this body, he knew that it would take time to call Maria and Cyril and his voice was also blocked with the trees and the sounds of birds chirping. But he then starts to think if he could just tell them there was something odd. If there was a loud noise that could reach far away, something that could stand out and catch their attention. Just then, he remembers when Cyril taught him about Madden, the existence of magic itself. 
He often taught the principles of magic itself to those who showed an interest in magic and luckily, he had talent in magic so as long as it was easy magic, he could still use it. But it was just simple magic like warming and cooling stuff. Hence, he wondered what he could do right now. However, for the sake of his brother, he was determined to do something as he remembers when Cyril once explained to him that while using magic was necessary to understand the formula, if that was not possible, then it was important to develop a detailed image in the mind. Having that in mind, he first makes up a ball by imagining a transparent ball, and then puts a crystal flower in this ball. He then collects water by imagining collecting it in the air inside the ball and surrounds it with a big ball. In order to be seen from a distance, he needed to throw it into the sky and in order to fly high, he imagined reducing the weight of the ball. Even though his magic power would decrease a lot, this was not the time to complain and he threw the ball up in the air. He rapidly raises the temperature of the outer magic power of the sphere and destroys the contents of the sphere which was completely filled with water and by doing all this, it results in a huge explosion in the air visible to everyone. Meanwhile, in the mansion, the knights rushed to check what was the explosion in the south garden and wondered if there was an intruder while a person just stood near the window and was intrigued seeing what just happened. After seeing a huge explosion in the southern park, everyone was shocked while Raymond was determined to save Gion. Just then, Cyril came rushing to him and immediately covered him and Gion while cursing his incompetence, as even though he was a magic user, he did not realize that there was an enemy in the garden. Worried, he asks him to be patient for the time being and stay on his guard since he could not sense any indication of the enemy's presence. While Raymond was simply seeing how cool Cyril looked at times like this, and once again, he discovered the charm of his master. However, this was not the time to think about that, so he tells him that he was the one who made that explosion. And more importantly, he shows him Giant's condition. Cyril quickly uses his manon and requests a doctor to come to the South Park immediately. The doctors take Gion, and Cyril assures him that everything will be fine now. But then before going, Gion calls Ray and thanks him. The doctors take him away, and Cyril then again starts to wonder what that explosion was exactly. Raymond tells him that he made that explosion, but he didn't really believe it. However, John steps up and backs him up, saying that it's true, and he was the witness. Everyone was surprised and could not believe that he pulled something like that even at that age. They wondered, could it be that he was gifted in magic as the successor of Bertrand? And if so, they believed it was actually terrible. Since he was Maya's son, they even thought that maybe he had something to do with Giant's condition and maybe he really intends to get rid of the first prince and become the crown prince by declaring repeatedly and purposely causing an explosion with magic. It was only natural that everything felt strange and suspicious. Meanwhile, Raymond contemplates that usually, he does not really care if he gets bad words from other people. However, today, he was planning a birthday party together with Gion. Just because he was his mother's son, he got rejected from Giovanni, and now he was suspected of rebellion by the maids there, even though he never asked for anything and never said anything. He tells Cyril that he was going back to his room and asks him to later inform him about Gion's condition. Cyril agrees and offers to take him to the room, however, he slaps his hand away and yells that he would go back alone. He runs off, and Cyril is left confused. Later, when he reached back home, Maria asked him if he was alright, and in response, he questioned her what he should do. Maria was shocked to see the look on his face as he thought to himself why was he born with memories of his previous life, a question he thought about since the time he was born. All of his brothers had their own duties. Frederick, as the crown prince, was in charge of helping their father's work, while Andrea and Orlin both studied outside the kingdom about diplomatic affairs. Bertrand graduated school with acceleration and was now teaching, and Giovanni had a talent for music and captivated many people, while Gian inspired others with his paintings. Hearing about all of them, he, who was born as the servant child, wondered what he could do. He had no talent in art, he was always suspected by people around because of his mother's statements. Since there was no war, there was no meaning for him to be so strong. Although he could actually become strong and become an adventurer, he did not really want to be a hero. He just wanted to be noticed realistically. If only he wasn't a royal family instead, was just a commoner. He believed that he would be freer than right now. He could not walk freely even inside the palace, and he was not allowed to talk to his other brothers. No one heard his words, and as soon as they saw him, the maids would immediately be grimaced. Without knowing their position, they continued to insult him. But just because there was Cyril and Maria, he was sure that he had enough. He felt that someday there would be someone who would understand him just like Giant, and for the sake of that time, he was ready to be patient until now because he was an adult. However, there was no escaping the fact that he was so lonely, and he started crying. 
Just then, Maria hugs him tightly and asks him to cry all he wants because she was always by his side. Therefore, he could freely cry all he wanted. He bursts into tears, and she says that it was fine if he said more selfish things since he listened too much to other people. A few days after that incident, Maria comes to his room and asks him if he was not going out today too, and he, who had covered himself in a blanket, states that even if he goes outside, the soldiers would only watch out for him. Hence, he was fine just in the room. He had started to isolate himself from anyone, or maybe he was just tired, but even though he wanted to ignore everything the people around him said and even if he was being treated as a bad person, he did not even think about it and could respond cynically. However, with just his mother's statements, everyone no longer looked at him. He did not really care anymore, and with that kind of intention, he didn't want to have this relationship either. He knew that it sounded childish but as a matter of fact, he was a five-year-old child now. Maria informs him that there were tea party invitations from Giovanni and Gian and asks him if he was interested. He inquires if it was from Giovanni too, and she says that yes it was, and it was to be held in the South Garden. Still, he tells her that he did not want to go to the South Park and thinks to himself that even though he has decided that he would only live in his room in the Southern Garden, since he was a royal family, it was impossible if he didn't show himself to the world. There were seven more years until his debut in high society, and until then, he had decided to shut himself up and become a high-spec neat. Just as Maria was about to leave, Cyril comes to the room and asks for his permission to come inside. He questions him if it's true that he did that explosion in the South Garden a few days ago. And as Raymond was about to answer, he looks at Cyril's face and sees that he was all stressed out. He starts apologizing to him after realizing that he must have troubled him, and Cyril assures him that it does not matter to him. Instead, he felt sorry for making him listen to something like that and apologized to him. He then questions him what he wants to know, and he asks him if he could tell him how he did it. In response, he simply smiles and says that he cannot trouble him anymore and Cyril was just speechless. He briefs him that people don't want to see him because when they see him, they feel that he was indeed aiming for the position of the crown prince, and Raymond answers that if he can understand that much, then that was enough for him. Cyril states that he was indeed very selfless and Ray smirkingly states that maybe. He's just greedy as he did not care about the other but he was not going to let him go. Cyril admits he cannot match his age because he was already at an age where he could even be called an old man. Hence, he asks him to let him stay beside him. Raymond then inquires what the person who asked him about the explosion really wanted to know, and in response, he apologizes to him in advance and then takes him to the North Garden. As they walk down the hallway, the maids yet again started whispering about him the moment they saw him while he on the other hand thought that when his eyes narrow, he actually felt much calm. Meanwhile, Cyril was ready to take actions against them, but he stops him, saying that it's meaningless since they did not really do anything. More importantly, he asks him about the North Park and what it was like over there. Just then, a man comes in front of him and tells him that there were two things in the North Garden. First, there was a garden where the Seville flowers were blooming beautifully. A mix of sky blue and beautiful flowering plants, he liked it too. Raymond immediately recognizes that the person in front of him was Bertrand and even though he had never communicated with him, he was one of his older brothers, the second prince, Bertrand Centro, and he further states that there was one main thing about the North Garden but rather than hearing it in words, he suggests that it's better if they go and see it in person, and they will continue their talk there. They finally arrive at the North Park, and it was massive, leaving Raymond amazed. Bertrand shows him a flower and asks him if this was his first time seeing this flower. He explains to him that this was a flower named Theo Age, and he could not see it because the flower color was soft compared to Seville. They then arrive in front of a dome in the garden where Raymond expresses that he was feeling cold and Cyril asks if he was feeling cold for the first time now. He realizes that it was indeed his first time feeling cold because in this world, there was no change in climate. A warm country would stay warm while a cold country was always cold, as the borders of the country could be seen separated by a thin veil with magic power. Bertrand states that instead of just asking, it was better if he just tries it right away and he enters inside the magic dome. Raymond followed him, and as he entered inside, he was astonished to see that it was all white. Cyril gives him his coat and suggests that if he stayed with him, maybe he would feel warm and also asks him if he would like to be carried by him to which he agrees. He then notices the same flower that his brother gave to him earlier, and he sees that the color changes. Bertrand explains to him that the flower changes its color depending on the temperature, and therefore, in cold places, it only blossoms with colors like blue, or purple cold shades. Raymond then sees a tree and questions him what that tree was called to which he answers that it was called Riveado. 
Although sometimes called forest-covered trees they were actually different from Riveado and he asks him if he knows what that difference was. Ray answers that frost-covered trees were just trees covered in ice or frost. However, Riveado was made of real ice. Bertrand was impressed by his answer and says that he was indeed smarter than anyone else and he really wanted him to show his intelligence later in school. He suggests continuing their chat inside the hut where his maids would prepare tea for them while Ray was surprised to see such a big mansion being called a hut as it was much bigger than a single build house in Japan. Bertrand then asks Cyril if he was also feeling cold since he was only wearing a shirt but he replies that he was not cold because he had fur, and even with carrying Raymond, he felt warm. Hearing that, he was simply amazed and started to think that even if he says he has fur, just because his cheeks were cold, it was impossible if it's not cold here. However, his master did not say it with his handsome appearance. He started to wonder if in that case, wasn't he absolutely perfect but then Bertrand invites them both inside. They sit down and have a cup of tea while he thinks that even though it was a terrace, it felt so warm and guesses if it was also magic. Bertrand then gets straight to the main topic and questions him how he could cause an explosion on such a large scale to which he responds that he simply used an explosion when the water evaporated. He understood that the magic he used was water spawn so he further asks him what about the heat magic and he answers that he still did not understand how to expel water so he made it by imagining collecting water in the air. Though Bertrand had never thought about it, he understood that it was not an impossible word either so he then asked him why there was water in the air and Raymond wondered if there was no general knowledge about this in this world. Nonetheless, he explains to him that from boiling water, water vapors come out and if they keep it heated by the fire, the water in the pot eventually disappears. In that case, where does the evaporated water go? An object that originally existed but suddenly disappeared. He questions if such a thing could happen meanwhile. In his mind, that's what he had only learned in science lessons in modern Japan. Bertrand understood that from that phenomenon alone, he predicted that water was contained in the air. He was immensely impressed and he tells him that just as he expected, secluding himself by Maya's side was definitely a waste. So, he asks him if he would like to go to school with him. Raymond says to him that he believes, for basic education, he had learned enough in the palace. To this, he responds that elementary education only teaches the basics of knowledge, but what he meant was after that. He tells him to continue studying high school and study magic. After that, it would be better if he goes to high school to research magic. Since he had that kind of thinking concept and point of view, he was sure that he should be able to quickly progress in the study of understanding magic in this world. It is then explained that in every country, there must be schools or academies. However, the academies in the Centro Kingdom were the biggest in the world. In the academy, there were three levels. Ordinary citizens and lower-class aristocrats studied general education, which was the elementary level. Then, studying a specialty, a middle level where there was a sorcerer specialization or a certain profession specialization available. Lastly, studying to be able to work as an academic lecturer, the high-grade level where people who have good grades or experienced people in a certain field at the middle level would learn how to teach others. Right now, Raymond's older brother Bertrand, who had reached the professorship position with acceleration, saw him, who did not know the existence of water in the air. His knowledge about stuff, even though he did not study a particular field of scientific knowledge when he was in Japan, was much more advanced than his. However, he did not really like studying, so he wanted to reject it and told him that he does not want to study. Bertrand replies that if he does not use his intelligence, he would be detrimental to society. He further says that he could pass on the things he realized to his older brother, and then his brother could publish it later. But Bertrand furiously slams the table and tells him not to joke around, as he was not that bad, to the point of admitting his own younger brother's research results as his own. Raymond gets a bit scared and apologizes to him, but then Bertrand also calms down and says sorry to him for yelling at him so harshly. However, he really does not mean to steal other people's research, even though as a result, his reputation might also increase, but he was not at all happy with it. After talking to him today, he started to think that Raymond was actually much smarter than him, which was also a kind of talent. Therefore, he wanted to avoid his talent being destroyed by his mother's thoughts. Even if it said that it was due to talent, more than that, he was genuinely worried about him. Therefore, he summoned him to this northern garden, a place where there were no maids. Ray thinks to himself that even though there were few maids who worked for his mother, precisely because of that few, his mother was greatly adored. If his mother found out that his older brother was trying to separate him from his mother, he was sure that all the maids wouldn't stay silent. Hence, he asked Cyril to ask him. In order to keep him away from his mother, he did such a tedious thing. 
Plus, he was the calm type in the end, and so, he tells him that he really has a bad trait. In response, he asks him to at least call him a tactician. Raymond then inquires if his questions were finished now, and he says that they were. As the first thing wanted to know, he already knew, but then there were also new questions. And since there were neither eyes nor ears to watch over them, he asks him if they could talk some more, and he agrees. But for the time being, he suggests that they have a constructive discussion. Until now, there was no one who could have a normal discussion with him, who was a five-year-old. Toys and picture books aimed at children, words that were easy for children to understand. It was not enough for him to have the values and ways of thinking of an adult. Therefore, he gets down to the discussion, and he starts off by saying that if someone is half-human and demi-human, then they would definitely inherit both traits. But usually, if a mixed human was like that, it would stand out more as a demi-human. So he asks him if he also thinks that's a lot closer to the demi-human themselves and if he had watched him down to the blood that flows down his body. Bertrand questions him how they could observe down to the blood, and he replies that they can't guess just from the appearance that makes up the human body. Meanwhile, in his mind, he was actually really happy that Bertrand was not treating him like a five-year-old. The discussion this time was why is Giant's body so weak, a child born between human and demi-human descent from the Nodos Guild country. He believed that he must have some sort of disability in his body. However, for the sake of establishing good relations with the Nodos Guild Kingdom, his father made the daughter of the elven tribal leader, representative of the Nodos Guild Kingdom, Sophia, the name of his concubine. And what was born were Giancarlos and Giovanni. However, as the people around him were concerned, both Gian and John had a problem. Gian's body was very weak and he always looked tired and seemed anemic, while John's body was indeed healthy. But even though he was also a descendant of an elf, he could not use magic that anyone should be able to use. Why did that happen? Currently, it was one of society's problems whose cause was still unknown. Bertrand guesses that it must have something to do with the most basic part related to a certain race. Currently, the strongest theory is that humans were the lowest race, while demi-humans were the top race. The body became so weak from not being able to withstand the power of the top race, and again, the thought that results from wasting strength to protect his body. The demi-humans possessed traits that were closest to spirit, whereas humans could use magic and it depended on individual talent. The demi-humans with the exception of those of mixed descent could also use magic. Therefore, mixed breeds were considered false and taboo and were hated. Even though his outward appearance did inherit the characteristics of a demi-human as a top race, the rest could be said that his signs were pretty bad. Raymond was surprised to see that he could think of the problems more simply, so he further asked him if it wasn't natural that magic was also influenced by talent since human DNA was also inherited from the very beginning. For example, between a white person and a black person, the more dominant black gene means a higher chance of having a brown-skinned child. So he wondered if it wasn't the same for humans and demi-humans too. If there was a child between a human and a demi-human, he and she should be able to inherit the characteristics of both. Whether humans could use magic or not, if that was just influenced by talent, then he believed that it was not if mixed breeds were the same. Bertrand tells him that the reason why mixed breeds could not use magic was that they were born among humans. So having talent, as a result, was influenced by inherited human traits. In that case, Raymond states that if they don't see the difference between humans and demi-human life, then they won't know for sure. He questions him if mixed breeds' living habits were closer to humans or demi-humans, to which he answers that it was closer to demi-human. So he further asks if it also applies to eating habits and exercise habits, and he confirms that it does, which leaves him to wonder what about malnutrition. It was known that elves got powers from nature while beasts got power from raw meat. If a seely creature, just for the sake of getting nutrients from water, then it won't eat as much as humans. Even though he was born with an absorption organ closer to that of a human, if he was eating like demi-human habits, then the absorption of what nutrients he eats won't go well, hence there was a possibility that Gian was malnourished. Bertrand also thinks about it and wonders if the nutrients needed to move the body were not sufficient. Then shall he just go to Giancarlo once to recommend the same food as them? Raymond asks him if Giant always ate the same food as an elf up until now, and he answers that he did, which leaves him contemplating that it could be anemia from exhaustion. He understood that his poor body condition was a symptom of malnutrition but then also thought why was he the only one aware of that possibility. He questions Bertrand why for the past 10 years, he was not aware of the possibility of Giant being malnourished, and he answers that it was the first time he had heard the word malnutrition. But it was a very precise term. He promises to pass it on to the medical department using his name. 
He was pissed and thought to himself that even though he had cut down the science knowledge of this world, it was still very low. He didn't expect the knowledge to be at this level, while knowledge of medicine that could be explained by science was equally low. He slams the table and states that starting now, giants should be provided food to gain nutrition in the form of meat, fish, and seeds, as he demanded for some rice and soybeans too. Seeing how mad he was, shortly after, Cyril told him that he doesn't want to ask him anymore in a low voice that he had never heard before and with a stern look in his eyes. For that, he felt really guilty. Just like that, one year passed, and Giant and John had come to visit Raymond. Maria informs him that the two of them have arrived, and he asks her to let them in. After Giant's eating habits had improved since that day, now he was feeling much better. After the case that happened in the South Park, John also came to apologize to him and thanked him. Since then, he started getting closer to John too. They all take a seat and ask Maria to make some tea as they had brought cake. Giant notices that he was wearing that loop tie, and Raymond says that it's because it was a gift from Giant, a gift that he wanted to give him in the South Garden during the tea party. John then inquires if he locked himself in his room again today, and he replies that he did, as even if he left the room, the people around him were not giving him a good impression either. But today, he did receive a lecture on the art of the sword from Cyril, and Bertrand also taught him. Every day, the two of them also came to play, so even if he didn't leave his room, he says that it was still fun. Giant then points out that he has got long hair too now, to which he responds that the green eyeball was an eye color that was only passed down to the royal family. Because of this, there was someone who had high hopes for him to be the crown prince. Giant could not understand why he hid it then, so he proceeds to change his hairstyle as he wanted him to show it in front of him and John. After doing so, he tells him that he really liked his eyes, which made Raymond a bit shy. Just then, John brings out the Shen that he brought for today. Shen was one of the instruments that John could play expertly, and originally, Shen was a musical instrument which was used to celebrate encounters with spirits in the United Kingdom of Nodos. He starts playing the instrument while Jian dances elegantly, which leaves Raymond completely stunned. As they finished their performance, he praised both of them and told them that it was very beautiful. Watching the expression on his face, Giant just melted away after seeing how cute his little brother was, while Raymond contemplated that among his family, there were few people that wanted to see him, and that is why, for him, the two of them were very special. Words slip out of his mouth, and he tells them that he really loves both of them, which makes the two of them all red-faced, and they quickly hug him, saying that they like him too. But then, later at night, when he was with his mother, she once again reminded him that he has to be the crown prince. She was sure that his father Abramo would realize one day that he really was a perfect fit for the crown prince. He had the same eyes as him and hair similar to hers, therefore, she wanted him to be the crown prince and the king of this land. In these six years, the words that kept repeating, he did not really know any other odds to use as an answer, and he says okay mom. She begged him to just stay by her side, and as tears started falling down her eyes, she asked him to never leave her alone, and once again, he said okay mom while thinking that her mother must just feel lonely, her worries after his birth and the statement that she always made about him, that he would be the crown prince. From that, his mother was avoided by the people around her, and was always alone. In front of his father, his mother was always shy, which his father misunderstood and never visited her room again. A vicious circle from Tsundir it was. His mother just wanted to get his father's attention, and that is why she wanted to make him the crown prince. She always pouted because there was no one to defend her, and he was the only one to talk to, making her very dependent on him. She didn't know the people he was related to, and she didn't know how to show good intentions. Then she who could not give and the one who kept screaming that she loves him, he found her very childish. She leaves the room, and Maria asks him if he would like some hot milk, and he says yes. As he sat alone in his room, he thought back that the only one who realized the misunderstanding between his father and mother was him alone. He had to pass it on, but he was not sure if it could change with just the words of a child like him. However, if he were to give up and just lament all the happiness that happened to him, he knew that was wrong. As Maria returned to the room with the milk, he asked her if tomorrow he wanted to talk to his father, how should he approach him, and it left her simply confused. The next day, he goes up to meet his father who states that it was a very rare day indeed. He quickly hugs his son, as this was the first time he said he wanted to meet him, while he tried to remind his dad that he was not a child anymore. Just then, a man intervenes and tells his father that Ray has something to talk about. The man was his first brother, first prince, Frederick Centro. After being saved by his brother, his father asks him what was it that he wanted to talk about, and he cuts straight to the point and tells him to cut it out and talk properly with his mother. The dad replies that Maya does not think about him at all, 
but he yells at him and says, how come he does not understand his mother's tsundir nature? Even so, he calls himself a harem king. His father and Frederick both were left confused as they had no idea what harem and tsundir meant while he jumped on him, calling him a lady killer. He questions him how many women he has seduced and if his mother's tsundir nature wasn't cute. Confused, the father asks him from where he was learning words like that, to which he responds that it does not matter. The point was, his mother really loves him. Because she liked him so much, she could not talk very well. Meanwhile, his dad, who was experienced about it, questions him why he could not understand it and treats her better. He asks him if he knows why his mother wanted him to be the crown prince, and the father replies that maybe it's because she loves her homeland. But he tells him that's not it. The main reason was because she liked him. That's why she thinks he was very cute because he had black hair and green eyes that were similar to his father's. If she supports him being the crown prince and if only he really becomes the crown prince, she believed that his father would definitely come to meet him. So, even though maybe he doesn't like it, that was the reason his mom wanted him to see her too. The father asks him if he knows whether Maya was in her room or not, and he tells him that she was in her room today. So, he inquires if he would like to go see her with his dad, and he says yes. He asks Frederick if he wanted to come too, but he refuses, saying that their dad really often forgets about family time, and therefore, he would be the one to do it there. Raymond looks at him and apologizes to him, and Frederick simply stares at him and says it's alright, even though it did not feel like that. But, having said that, the two of them head out, and the dad points out that Ray has gotten heavier, as it had been a long time since he carried him. It's not like he was not satisfied with being a king and all, but not being able to feel the days his son was growing up really made him lonely, and he gets a bit emotional. Raymond asks him if he feels lonely too, and he replies that he does. Although it was better to have a wife as an empress or concubine. However, when the fourth concubine Maya came, every time there was a new concubine, the things that were important to him kept growing. And for the sake of all of them, he was so busy ruling this country that his time to meet them all was getting less and less. In the end, he neglected the people who were precious to him. Every time that happened, he always wondered who he was really living for. There were even times when he thought it was strange. He asks him if all this was too hard for him, and he started thinking to himself that even though all this time he thought his dad was just a kisser, he was more than that. But nonetheless, he needed to get rid of that so he said to him that he preferred his mother more than him. After all, they spent a lot of time together, and hearing this, the dad was deeply hurt. However, Raymond kisses him on the cheek and tells him that he also likes him too. A dad who always worked hard for everyone's sake, he understood it completely, and the dad was glad to hear that and said that his son might be a genius. They finally arrive outside Maya's room, and knowing that he has to face her properly, he knocks on her door. Meanwhile, Maya, who is still thinking about whether Abramo loves him or not, tells them to come in. The moment Abramo comes in, she freaks out and quickly hides behind the curtains. She questions him why he came there since it was very strange for him to suddenly enter her room. He sadly apologizes to him, and she says if he wanted her to forgive him, he should go out. However, Raymond tells him that what his mother was trying to say was because he did not tell her before. She could not dress up properly. She states why she would have to dress up for him, and he says that it was not her true feeling, as she was simply shy, and she gets all embarrassed. Abaramo, on the other hand, seeing them both like that, bursts into laughter and tells Maya that she was cuter than he thought. He slowly walks up to her, tells him not to come near while Raymond translates that she means to say don't come near because she is shy. Hearing that, Abaramo hugs her tightly and apologizes to her as he was the one who was wrong for not realizing her true desire. He admits that it was all his fault and that he wanted to be with her all the time. She breaks down and questions him why he was saying that now after all this time and says that she would not forgive as he continued to embrace her. Meanwhile, Raymond contemplates that from his mother's perspective, his father was the most influential person in the world who was far apart in age from her, and he asked her to marry him. So of course, she was worried. However, because of his father's kindness, his mother, who was a homely girl, fell in love and agreed to marry him. On the other hand, because she was a new wife who was far apart in age from him, his father did not understand how to relate to her. So, he pats them both on the head and tells them that they should communicate properly, and if they don't tell the truth, they must show their good intention through action. Having said that, he decides to go back to Frederick's place but then before leaving, he smirkingly says to them that he wants a little sister now. Maya got all red-faced while Abaramo asks him if a little brother would be okay, to which he answers that even though it's a younger brother, he would still love him. And Maya on the other hand simply melted from embarrassment. 
Later, he arrives at Frederick's room, who inquires him how their father was. Raymond tells him that he was talking with his mom, and he then asks if he could stay here for a while. Just then, a man comes up to him and introduces himself as Frederick's servant, Bernard Bernini, who expresses what an honor it was to meet him. Ray questions him if he was from Duke Bernina's family, and Bernard was surprised that he knew about them. Duke Bernina's family was the family of the First Empress so in other words, Bernard and Frederick were related as cousins. Bernard further states that Frederick had no interest in the dukes within the empire while Frederick asks him not to say such a thing. But, putting that all aside, he serves Ray some tea, and he thanks him for the service. Bernard tells him that he was being very polite and that he doesn't have to use polite words like that to him. But Ray says that it's because Bernard was older than him, and besides, he saw it from a perspective such as if he abdicated and became a commoner one day. Both Federal and Bernard were shocked hearing him say that, and Frederick questions him what does he mean by saying such a thing. He explains that it was always noisy around his mother and because he was the cause, he could not laugh at the chaos in his family. He didn't want to be the crown prince either, and if only he could get rid of this thing sooner, he believed then it would be more comfortable for him. Frederick continues staring at him and asks if he really wants to leave the house, and he says that he does. So he then further questions if nobody pressed him to be the crown prince, then he won't leave the house, right? And he answers yes but also asks him if doesn't he dislike him too which actually broke Frederick while Bernard bursts out in laughter. Frederick tells him that he was his precious little brother from the start. However, Ray says that his expressions were too obvious and besides eyebrows, his facial muscles moved too much, which was kinda scary. Frederick, on the other hand was devastated and started thinking that because of this face, he was shunned by Giovanni and Giancarlo simply trembled whenever he saw him, which was quite sad. Bernard, on the other hand, continued laughing and reminded him that Ray also said he must hate him. Ray then states that if it was not the case, then he should also properly say it which was actually embarrassing for Frederick while Bernard enjoyed seeing that he was being schooled by his own brother. However, Frederick agrees and asks him if he would like to be his chat friend sometime, and he answers that if it's alright, he could be his tea friend which lights up his face brightly. Bernard teases him and states that he must be feeling good since he was always worried about Ray and Frederick tells him to shut up. He informs him that he would send the tea date later by mail and asks Bernard to take him back. As they were about to leave the room, he overhears Bernard asking Raymond if he could call him Ray which made him feel nervous, and Ray who noticed that, inquired if something was wrong. Frederick asks him if he could call him Ray too, and he replies that of course he can while thinking that it felt like his affection like I will do something for you is getting to work. Frederick then gently pats him and tells him that he was looking forward to their tea party. Ray also greets him goodbye but before going. He spreads his arms and says that hugging each other isn't a weird thing since they were family after all, and that they should learn a little from their dad as he does not care about the place and still kisses him. Frederick simply smiles and agrees that he was right and so, he hugs him and tells him to come again sometime. Later, when he reaches back to his room, Gian and John had come to play with him but seeing him with Bernard, they get a bit scared and ask why he was with him. He explains that he was brought here by him and Bernard greets them both which only made them even more creeped out. He questions what he did to his brothers, and Bernard who was simply enjoying their reaction explains to him that when they met Frederick, whose face was already scary, he stared intently from behind and scared them both even more. Ray punches him out of anger since he just did it for fun and he quickly starts apologizing. He then leaves the room, and Gian worriedly asks him if he was okay and if he was bothered by him but he assures him that he was fine since he just talked with Frederick and was simply walked here by Bernard. Both of them were shocked to hear that and they questioned him didn't he feel scared and he responded that actually, he found him to be a funny person, surprising them even more. He also briefs them that next time, he was going to have tea with him and invites them both to come but they both pass on it immediately. He tries to convince them and says that he was actually quite fond of his little brothers and after trying to talk to him, he was really a funny person. Therefore, it could not be helped if they didn't want to but if they were interested, he requested them both to come too. Seeing his face and after being told like that, they could not really refuse him and so, they both agreed and promised to join him. After some time, Maria comes in and informs him that there was a tea invitation letter that came from Frederick. Since he was about to join, he asks her if she could prepare the gifts in his place and she agrees. He notices that she was in a very good mood and wonders if she was feeling happy that he was communicating well with his older brothers. Cyril had also come to take care of him and as usual, he was amazed to see how cool he was. He remembered that this year Cyril was going to be 30 years old and Maria was 24 years old. So they both could get married and he was sure that he would love their child later. 
he was not going to allow Maria to marry a half-hearted man and he wanted his master to marry the best woman there was. Just then, Bertrand also arrives there and inquires if he was going somewhere since it was so rare for him to go anywhere other than his place or Giovanni's and Giancarlo's. Ray briefs him that he was having a tea party at Frederick's place and hearing that, he asks if he could join them too. Ray states that he does not really know if the tea and snacks were enough but Bertrand simply responds that it does not matter since the maids would always prepare a lot and having said that, he grabs him and takes him with him. When they arrive there, Bernard greets them and was surprised to see that Bertrand also came. He informs him that today Andrea was also here and he gets really pissed. Ray asks if something happened between them and Bernard explains that it was just a family quarrel. Just then, a man comes up to them and greets him as this was the first time he was talking to him and introduces himself as Andrea, another one of his older brothers, the third prince of this land, Andrea Centro. Ray asks him if he was also joining them today and he replies that he was, or rather, he was the sponsor. As he tries to shake his hand, Bertrand intervenes and tells Andrea not to touch him. Andrea questions him, what does he mean by that and he says that he will be too soft to him, so he should just leave it to him. While Raymond thought to himself, how did it come to this? He goes up to Frederick and tells him that Andrea and Bertrand were fighting. But Frederick explains they don't actually fight, they were just arguing because of him. He asks if it was really about him when suddenly Andrea yells from behind that he just wanted to help Frederick from the field that he was not good at. Bertrand questions if he was not just talking about diplomacy, but also a personal relationship. They both continue to insult each other for a while, while Frederick tells Ray that his lack of communication skills as the crown prince was making a problem and just wanted the two of them to cooperate with him. Raymond comments that they were just like a husband and wife who were fighting over the education of their children. After having enough of them, he yells at them and tells them to cut it out. Starting from Bertrand, he questions him if he came here just to argue with Andrea. Also, as a crown prince, he should be good at academics, but he asks him if it would actually be a problem if he suddenly talked to an expert. He answers that it's not like that while Andrea was enjoying all that. Then he yells at him too and says that he understands he was worried about him but he should leave that to Frederick since that's how social life works. Lastly, he shifts his attention to Frederick, however, he was actually looking very impressed. So, he questions him why he was looking so happy, and he states that he was not really angry and rather, he enjoyed whatever he had to say. Therefore, he decides not to say anything to him if he already understands. After putting that all aside, they all finally sit together and begin their tea party. Maria had already made the cake, which became a hot topic in the Oslo imperial capital, and Andrea was quite interested in it. Frederick then asks Raymond if he had decided which faculty he would enter at school. In Centro Royal Institution's high school, there were many academies there, and the one who taught at the Magic Academy was Bertrand. He tells them that he was still very confused about the magic study program. When it comes to learning magic, he admits that Bertrand's words were easy to understand, but compared to that, he preferred the Knight Academy. Frederick questions him if he was actually serious about the story he spoke of earlier in town, and he confirms. Both Bertrand and Andrea freak out, and they ask him why he was choosing to give up the royal title. Meanwhile, Maria was also devastated to hear that. So, he goes up to her and says that he still hasn't decided which one to choose, and besides, he could not calm down until he gets to see her getting married. Also, he was worried about Cyril's potential mate too, so he was not going down to the city until then. Frederick then asks if Maria was not to get married, would he stay here? However, Raymond warns him that if he dares to interfere with her marriage, he would hold a grudge against him for the rest of his life. Especially when it comes to her marriage, he was not going to let a man who could not overcome the odds to marry her. Bernard states that he must really like Maria if he was going to these lengths, and he replies that he does since she was like his own sister. Since she still belonged to a noble family, Frederick inquired from her if she has a fiancé for now, and she says she has none as she kept rejecting people for the sake of waiting for Raymond to grow up. Frederick tried to imagine the two of them as a couple, but she was 24 and there was an 18 years age gap. However, Raymond gets offended from that and states that if he was engaged with Maria now, he would not be attending this tea party anymore. Bertrand expresses that when compared to marrying Maria, Lindra's fiancé candidate, the Balrushia family definitely would not stand still, while Ray asks if he already has a fiancé for him. But they told him they were not sure if there were girls of his age. He starts to wonder if he should just go down to the city already, but then Bertrand comes to him and tells him that whatever he was thinking, he was there to help him, so there was no need to rush. Then Andrea also chips in, saying that he would also be worried if he was alone and therefore, he was also ready to help him and promises to protect him. 
In response, he bluntly states that either way doesn't matter and inquires who was the condition of the royal faction now. They explain to him that the current ruling faction was his mother, who belonged to the Maya faction, and Frederick's mother was a member of Karina's faction. The Maya noble faction wanted to put him in full charge. Meanwhile, Karina's faction wanted to make him their pawn. He asks if that means his mother was just a royal ornament, and Bertrand was surprised to see that he could call his own mother an ornament without a doubt. However, Andrea then expresses that instead of talking about the noble faction, it was better to talk about his school. Hence, he asks him why he wants to enter the Knight Academy. Even though it could be better than the Magic Academy, he wanted to know his reason for studying swordsmanship. Raymond finally tells him that the truth is, he wanted to be someone like Cyril which even left Cyril himself shocked. As all of them started staring at him, he nervously apologizes to them. Andrea questions him why he wants to become like Cyril that much, and he answers that he treats everyone gently, even kids like him. So there was actually no reason not to idolize him. As a man, he wanted to be admired as a strong person and that was also his goal after returning to the palace from his long journey. Throughout their training, he always supported him fully and even when his hands and feet hurt, he always gave him a helping hand while reminding him that he still has a long way to go. Just thinking about those times, his admiration for him grew even more, and he states that Cyril was a very gentle man. His solid muscles made his body very sturdy, and because of that, the feeling of being safe when carried by him felt very special to him. He was willing to get his knees dirty to make Cyril gentle with him, and he always asked for permission before carrying him, without being overbearing. Meanwhile, Cyril starts getting embarrassed and requests him to stop. But he tells everyone to just look at him as he was a figure that combined cool and cute and also humble. Impressed, Frederick asks Cyril to take care of Raymond from now on, and he gladly accepts while Andrea wonders as the last child. Why does he not idolize his brothers and instead choose Swordmaster Cyril? Bertrand explains to him that it can't be helped and they have to support him for a long time. But then, Raymond comes to him and says that from now on, he also wants to talk more with him which made him really happy and he hugs him. Just then, another man enters the room and he was very excited to see Raymond there. His name was Orlando, and they both greeted each other as it had been a long time since they saw each other and was the first time they got to talk like this. Orlando Centro was the fourth crown prince who was studying abroad in the kingdom of Oxidens. He fell in love at first sight with a royal princess and immediately proposed to her like a real man. He had the same mother as Frederick, but he wondered why their facial expressions were so different. Orlando tells him that his wife really wants to talk to him, but he asks him if he wasn't living in Oxidens. He explains to him that after Anne and he entered school, they proceeded to Oxidens. But then Andrea tells him to stop calling him that as it sounded like a girl's name. In the past, he did actually look very much like a woman, and Bertrand also confirms that it's true that he used to be very cute. Andrea says to him not to act like that since they were only one year apart, and when Bertrand mentions that he was indeed his older brother, he straight refuses to recognize him as a brother. Orlando, on the other hand, comments that the two of them still get along, pissing both of them simultaneously. Frederick then asks him if his relationship with Princess Francisca was okay, and he gets all shy and starts telling them she was very cute. Every time he talked about other women in front of her, she always gets jealous which just made her look even more cute. Then from behind, he slowly hugs her, and she innocently does the put your hand in mine. He also mentions that she always wears gold and pink dresses at parties and asks them if they know why. Raymond answers that it harmonizes with Orlando's hair and eyes which was precisely right. He further says that he also used a purple gemstone to match Francisca's hair color, and his dress was orange which matched her eye color. Suddenly, Andrea interrupts him, yelling that Frederick and Orly said the same thing without even understanding it. Frederick tells him that his way of speaking is annoying and just like that all of them start arguing and make a complete mess while Raymond starts getting annoyed. He asks Ruto if he could go back now, but he says that everything is still not finished. However, he wanted to go back since he was not important here anymore, and Ruto bluntly tells him to stay here even if it sucks. So, he finally snaps and yells at all of them to stop all this. He reminds all of them that they did not come here to fight and were here for the tea party. Even then, Orlando asks him what gift was suitable for Francisca, and he says that he should think for himself since she would be happier if the gift was chosen by himself. Everyone else starts apologizing to him, and he tells them to just make up already. Just then, someone knocks on the door, and when the door opens, it turns out Giancarlo and Giovanni had also arrived at the party. Giant and John nervously say that they heard Ray was having a tea party with Frederick. Even though they knew it was rude to attend without an invitation, 
They ask if it's okay for them to participate just for a little while. Ray gets up and quickly hugs Giant, saying that it's his Giant replenishment and would replenish John after this. But for now, he gives Giant a tight squeeze. After that, he hugs John too and as his replenishment is completed, he looks at the rest of them and asks what's up with their faces. Seeing him acting like a normal six-year-old, they all wanted to spoil him too. He simply replies that even he has times when he wants to be spoiled since he's still a kid. He points out to everyone, starting with Bertrand, and tells him that when it comes to magic, he gets really fixated on it. As for Andrea and Orlando, today was the first time he had spoken to them properly, but already figured out that when they talk about themselves, they don't see what's around them. Frederick, on the other hand, could not leave him by himself. Rather than getting spoiled by him, it was more like he was supporting him. Making an evaluation of Frederick as a crown prince, he states that it takes more than one person to make a country. No matter how capable he is, a king who cannot win people over is basically incomplete. After all, a king should be someone everyone wants to help, which goes for him too. Having said that, he says that when Frederick becomes the king, he would help him out. Hearing that, Frederick simply melts away. But putting all that aside, he takes Giant and John and sits in the middle of them as all the seven brothers are finally together in a room now. Giant still nervously asks if it's really okay for them to join. Frederick, with a scary face that he had, tells him that he does not mind, which was, in fact, his happy face. Ray understands that he's so happy that he was able to talk to Giant that his whole body went all tense. However, Giant cannot get that, and trembling in fear, he apologizes to him, leaving an awkward silence between the two of them. Frustrated, Raymond yells out that this was all such a pain to watch. Only adolescent boys and girls could not talk honestly when their eyes met. So he tells Frederick to go on and say what's on his mind to Giant. Frederick musters up the work and assures him that he's not angry. It's just that he's not used to talking. Therefore, he apologizes for the misunderstanding. Giant still nervously tells him that he doesn't need to apologize. But then Raymond says to him that he shouldn't be too lenient with him. Frederick further states that he understands he's scared of him. But if possible, he tells Giant and John that he wants to get along with them. Giant also opens up and says that he had always avoided him despite not knowing much about him. But he also wants to get along. Then John adds on that they never even tried to get to know him. So, if anything, they should be the ones asking him. Even though they're not nearly as knowledgeable about magic as Bertrand and are not good at talking to people like Andrea was, and they cannot take action like Orlando could, he wants to get along with them. However, he's just a half-wit who cannot even use magic. Frederick goes up to John and assures him that things like that don't matter at all. He completely understands that children born of humans and demi-humans are scorned. But the two of them are still his family. Therefore, no matter what bad mouths them, he would never refuse to acknowledge them as his brothers for a reason like that. Hearing that, the two of them get very emotional, as they hope they will always be together. Seeing them like that, Frederick doesn't really know what to do when Ray comes up to him and tells him to go and comfort them by giving them a hug. However, he's too shy to do it. But, looking at Ray's eyes, he finally agrees. He holds them both and says that he's not good at talking but he wants to get to know the two of them better. So, he asks them if they would come to see him again. Overjoyed, Giant tells him that they definitely will, and they both hug him. After a while, Giant has finally calmed down, while John, on the other hand, is just ashamed of the way he acted. Nonetheless, Andrea says that it's cute as normally. They cannot spoil each other since they never got close to each other to begin with. However, Orlando was glad since Giant, John, and Ray are his only younger brothers, so he asks if he could spoil them too. Meanwhile, Bertrand goes on to say that for now, the movements of each faction are not as active as when Lady Maya was isolated. They are also different from in the old days when they were helpless against the movements of the faction. The power of the Maya faction fell when Maya and their father became closer. Hence, right now, the most they could do was to send a fiancé candidate to bring them into their faction. But getting back to the young ones, he tells the three of them to feel free to rely on them anytime they need. Andrea then confirms from Giant if he's 11 years old, and he says that he is, while Bertrand asks John if he goes to middle school. He answers that he does. However, he does not have any talent with magic or swords. Because of that, his father introduced him to a music teacher, and due to Giant's poor health, he decided not to enroll in the academy last year. It's common for children to enter middle school at the age of 14. Although the minimum age to enroll in middle school is 12 years old, there is no upper limit, so 15-year-old John could enroll at any time. However, there are many people like him who choose not to enroll if they are able to find their own teacher. As for Giant, he expresses that he's still worried about his body, so he's not going to enroll. 
Hence, they all conclude that their current problem is Jayan and Ray's social debut, and including Giovanni, there is also the problem of finding fiancés for three of them. Frederick questions whether Ray has Balsher's backing, and Andrea says that Father has not admitted it yet, and the Maya faction cannot overlook it. Bertrand believes that most likely, the Maya faction would try to provide a wife for Raymond, and if anything, they should be trying to get Gio and Jayan, who are close to Raymond, under their influence. Meanwhile, Ray, who is just exhausted at this point, states that he just wants to become a monk, leaving an awkward silence in the room. Meanwhile, in a mansion where a girl named Lindra lived, her father told her that she must become engaged to his highness at all costs. The fate of the Nalsher family depended on her, and she understood it as she looked out the window, whispering Raymond's name. The scene then shifts back to Raymond where Jayan was drawing a portrait of him. He asks him if he was really thinking of becoming a monk and he assures him not to worry because even if he became a monk, he understood that he would only lose the right to inherit the throne. He would not actually be removed from the royal family like reducing himself to a commoner. Hence, there was no need to worry about it that much. Jayan yells at him and says that of course he cannot do that because his dream was to hold his child someday. To him, he was an important member of the family and the one who saved his life. Therefore, he wanted him to be the happiest person of all. He could not do anything for him like their older brothers, but even so, he did not want to give up on him. This was his selfish desire but someday, he wanted to paint a portrait of him, his wife, and his children, just like he had drawn a portrait of him right now. Raymond thinks to himself that if it would make Jayan that sad, then he should only become a monk or reduce himself to a commoner as a last resort. So in other words, he no longer had the option to escape from the royal palace's faction conflict. Frankly, he believed that it was a huge hassle and he knew that he could not do anything about it by himself because aside from his memories of his past life, everything about him was completely normal. Still, he decides to do his best. Having said that, he reminds Jayan that aside from that, the Maya faction was trying to win him over too. Since his social debut was in two months, he asked him to be careful as he did not want him to endure something unpleasant because of him. Jayan simply smiles and states that he understands he likes him. He knew that if he was unhappy, it would make him sad too. Plus, if he himself was not happy, then there was no point, otherwise, Gio and his mother would definitely blame themselves. He looks at Ray and says that he really seems to love his family. However, he was not the only one, as he also loved his family a lot too. Hearing that, Ray immediately bows to him and yells that his older brother was the best in the world. Jayan returns the compliment, and just then, Gio also arrives there. Hearing them say that, he adds on that in that case, his little brothers were the best in the world. Both of them were glad to see him there. He briefs them that their father was very excited about preparing Jayan's outfit for his debutante in two months. Andrea was also eager to decide the outfit's design. For that, they were calling a seamstress to the drawing room, and hence, he asks him if now was a good time. Jayan agrees to go to them and bids farewell to Ray. Just then, Gio comes up to Ray and questions him if he was really thinking about becoming a monk. He tells him too that he was not going to become a monk, so Gio then further states that the main problem was what to do with him until he turns 14 because once he reached that age, he would be able to go to the academy where it would be safer than staying in the royal palace. However, Raymond expresses that the problem was his hairs and eyes. He had the black hair of the Ost Empire and the green eyes of the Centro Kingdom, and he did not want to stand out too much. With hair that black, Gio also doubted that dyes would do anything. But then he wondered if he were to make his hair gray, would that make it less unique? He decides to try it out and casts a weakening magic, limiting his target to the melanin pigments in his hair. Just like that, he successfully changes his hair color, believing that nobody in the academy will find out that he was royalty. Hold on. If you guys are loving this video, make sure to comment, we are loving it, because that is how I get to know that. Now, getting back to the story. He asks Gio how he was looking. However, Gio was just creeped out and requests him to change it back since it was such a beautiful color. So, he uses the melanin strengthening magic and turns them back to black, and Gio hugs him, saying that he really does like this color better. Putting that all aside, Ray asks him shouldn't they be worrying about him more than him right now because if any of them was going to get a fiancé, it was most likely him. If he was not going to the academy, he would have no escape from it either. Gio explains to him that that won't be a problem because he was actually thinking of going to his mother's home country, the United Kingdom of Nodos, to study music for a while. Ray was shocked since this was his first time hearing this, and he asks him if Jayan was also going with him, to which he replies that he was not. It seemed he had something else he wanted to do. So, he then asks him wouldn't he be suffering from Jayan deficiency, and he tells him that it's not like he would never see them again. 
he could come back to Chentro as much as he wanted, and it was not like he was losing his hometown. Raymond thinks in his mind how he used to believe that Geo would not leave the royal palace as long as Jian was here. But seeing that everyone was trying to move forward, he could not help but think that his brothers were very cool. Geo further says to him that when he goes to the academy, he could also study abroad. If that happened, he wanted him to come and see him then, and Ray immediately states that he would surely come and see him. Having said that, he tells him that he would be waiting for him so that he could listen to him play the Shan at the Elf Village. Later, Jian was finally ready for his social debut, and all his brothers complimented him, saying that he truly looked just like an angel. Bertrand also admits that Andrea was indeed talented in terms of fashion sense. Therefore, they counted on him for Raymond's social debut as well, and he happily agreed. Meanwhile, Ray was in his room since he was not old enough to enter high society. Therefore, he was alone tonight as well. Maria asks him if he would like to have some drink, and he says yes, so she heads out to grab one while he wonders if Jayan was having fun. Just then, someone knocks on his door, leaving him quite surprised because if it was a family member or a servant, they usually ask permission to enter the room. However, considering that they did not, he knew that the one who knocked on the door just now was an outsider who was not familiar with the inside of the royal palace. He walks up to the door but could not sense anything from the other side of it. So, he nervously opens the door and outside, he sees a girl crying and looking for her father. The girl was none other than Lindra. He was quite confused, so he asks her if she was lost or something, but she gets startled. Looking at her, he thought to himself that she seemed to be about the same age as him and wondered if she wandered this far from the main hall. He asks her if she was okay and if he should call someone, even though there were only servants present. However, she, on the other hand, was just mesmerized looking at his eyes, and suddenly, she screams in shock. Looking at his black hair and green eyes, she asks him if he was actually Prince Raymond, and he tells her that he was as he introduces himself and greets her. She was dumbfounded and continues to scream in shock while Maria also comes in and asks him what was the matter. He explains to her that it seems like she was lost, so he decides to accompany her to the main hall. Maria also offers to help her change clothes. He asked her to stay with her since she was all by herself until just now, so he was sure that she was feeling anxious. He goes back to his room to get ready, and since it was a public place, he understood that he should look a bit presentable. So, after getting dressed, he goes back to the girl and asks if she has calmed down now. Lindra gets up and elegantly introduces herself as the daughter of the Duke Balsher, and expresses what an honor it was to make his acquaintance on this day. He then takes her hand and offers to escort her to the main hall. As they walked, he asks her with whom did she come to the royal palace, and she answered that she came with her father. He then confirms from her if she was not still able to enter high society, and she says yes while also explaining that she came here to observe her father's work. She was thinking of going home when it was time for the party, but the king told her that she could at least eat some sweets. Meanwhile, he recalls that her father was the head of the Balsher family, also known as General Balsher. He was taught swordsmanship by the previous Duke of Balsher, and to his father, the current General Balsher was like a brother to him. He then also remembers that his brother said before that Lindra was his fiancé candidate. But he puts that aside and asks her why she was here by herself since his room was quite far from the main hall. In response, she requests him not to laugh as she explained to him that the garden she saw from the window was so beautiful that she wanted to see it up close. So, she snuck away, and then the next thing she knew, she got lost. Ray chuckles a little, thinking that she was kind of cute. But then, she holds his hand and questions if she were to ask him to show her around. Would that be selfish of her? He simply smiles at her and apologizes to her. She immediately understands what he meant, which broke her heart a little, and she even got a bit emotional as he contemplated that her father, General Balsher, was part of the Karina faction which supports Federico as the crown prince. In other words, if he were to become closer to her, nobles would spread rumors that he has joined the Karina faction, and he could not let that happen. However, he also felt Maria's cold gaze piercing him right at that moment, saying that he must not make a lady cry. Just then, her father also arrives there along with Cyril, and he asks her where she has been. She was quickly relieved to see her father again, and she told him that she got lost, so Raymond accompanied her here. He was surprised to see Raymond there, and even though he was planning on escaping before things became troublesome, he greets the father and says that he was also surprised when she knocked on his door, and she seemed to be in a predicament. With a serious look, he also states that he thought it might have been someone who wanted to use this party as a pretext to form a connection to him, catching the general off guard. But then he quickly laughs and says that he was just kidding while also asking if he was surprised. 
the general admits that he was even wiser than he had heard. However, since this was the first time he was speaking to him like this, he was amazed to see that he had inherited the black hair of the Ost as well as the green eyes of the Chentro, which was quite magnificent. He finally understood why there were people in the royal palace who supported him as the next king. Ray responds that they were his mother and father's colors, so he liked them too and he was often praised for them. So, the general asks him, praised by whom? And he simply teases him and replies that it's a secret as he had no intention to be so careless as to speak to a person who he was not close with. The general was grateful for the warning while he wondered if he's close with the Maya faction and if they were plotting something behind the scenes. Ray, on the other hand, wanted him to bicker with him more. Meanwhile, Maria could not understand why he was instigating him, and then he further says that he would prefer if he does not pry into it since he promised he would keep it a secret. While thinking that if he says that, the Karina faction and the Maya faction will focus on investigating those around him. However, even if they tried to dig something up, they would not find anything. Just then, Lindra calls him out, and she asks him if he would get engaged with him, leaving everyone in the room stunned except Ray himself. The father's face suddenly lights up, and he questions her if she really likes him, to which she replies that earlier, she did not know that the place she wandered into was his room and it was pretty rude of her. However, he did not criticize her for it even once and just like a gentleman, he escorted her here. Therefore, she wanted Raymond to be the person she marries, while the father, on the other hand, was happy to see how convenient all of this turned out. So, he uses this opportunity and asks him for his opinion while boasting that his daughter was quite intelligent. He also suggests they could start off as fiancés for the time being since marriage was far in the future. Raymond, on the other hand, started getting annoyed since they intended to make him her fiancé from the start and to bring him into the Karina faction from the start, which he could not accept at all. However, he could feel that Maria's gaze was actually terrifying, so he could not be tactless with his refusal. Hence, he takes Lindra's hand and apologizes to her, telling her that he cannot be her fiancé. He used all his acting skills and said to her that the problem is not with her, it's just that if he was with her, it would cause trouble for her. Lindra replies that if she could be with him, then she would not mind a bit of trouble at all. But he tells her he does not want to drag anyone else into it, and she starts crying. He further says that if she still likes him when she becomes an adult, she could tell him that again then. But right now, he wanted to give her his answer from today. And since he was a man after all, he wanted to be the one to say these things. Having said that, he promises to her that until they become adults, he would become strong enough to protect her. Lindra gets all shy and states that she will be waiting for him. She also promises that she would improve herself too so that she could protect him while Ray thought that she's a very strong-willed girl and would be too good for him. He then takes his leave, and they both say goodbye to each other while Cyril also decides to escort Maria and Raymond. As they walked back to his room, Maria asks him if that was really all right what he just said. Duke Balsher was one of the leading nobles of the Karina faction, and she believed that it would be preferable to seek the protection of the Karina faction. But he answers that he cannot do that. He needed to become the bait in order to arrange things so that the Karina faction and the Maya faction would focus on him. She and Cyril both question him why would he want to do such a thing, and he simply replies that it's to protect Giant. Meanwhile, Gia was still in the party, and Gio walks up to him and asks if he was tired, and he says that he was not. Ray had given him a healthy body, and he needed to do his best as the sixth prince. He wondered what Ray was doing right now as he looked forward to the day when they could enter high society together. The scene then shifts back to him, and he explains to Maria and Cyril that right now, he was the only one who was meant to force Federico down from his position as crown prince. However, if he were to join the Karina faction and leave the royal palace, then the nobles of the Maya faction would search for a replacement for him. If that happened, then their next target was most likely the one with the most magical power out of all his brothers, Giant. He also thinks that since he used to be frail, they had left him alone all this time. But now that he was healthy, he was sure that he would definitely be targeted. Compared to him, who had memories of his past life, Giant, who was just a normal kid, would just end up having the adults use him however they pleased. Therefore, he just needed to be the bait until Giant finds a way to escape on his own. After that, he had decided to enter the academy, change his appearance, and go into hiding. He was sure that he would learn a lot of things and meet a lot of people at the academy. Friends who were equal to him, which he could not have here. There was a whole new world out there that he knew he wouldn't find in the royal palace. But until then, he had decided to protect Giant. Hearing all that, Maria was worried for him while Cyril goes up to him and asks if he could become the shield that protects him. But Raymond tells him that he cannot because he was an honorary noble of this kingdom, so siding with him personally would be troublesome. 
Cyril was formerly a commoner adventurer, an S-rank adventurer of which there were only a few in the entire world. He had power on par with a duke's family, and if he had him by his side when he became an adult, the opinion that he was trying to force Federico down from the position of crown prince would begin to seem more credible. If that happened, then he would be treated as a traitor. In response, Cyril says that he will also improve himself until he is able to protect him and Maria, and if Ray did not want him to be his shield, he was ready to be his sword too. However, he tells him that he does not need a sword or shield, and if it were to put him in danger, then he himself would rather be the one to die. Hearing that, Cyril was left speechless, but then Ray further says to him that rather than dying for his sake, if he could resolve himself to live for his sake, then he would also resolve himself to make him his right-hand man. Cyril accepts that but also asks that if he were to be his right-hand man, wouldn't it be even more meaningless for him to not be at his side, and he answers that it would. If he were to ever fall into somebody's plot and could not find a way out, in times such as those, he requests him to become his sword. And when he does, he is also determined to die alongside him, and Cyril agrees. However, he warns him that if he tries to throw away his life just because of that, then he would cut him loose and will say that they are not comrades anymore. Therefore, he was not going to let him stubbornly insist on dying for his sake, and Cyril agrees with him. Meanwhile, Maria stood there and thought to herself how powerless she was. She could not become his sword or shield like Cyril, and therefore, she could not be of use to Raymond. But then, he goes up to her and tells her that she was just like a mother, older sister, and teacher to him, so if he ended up in a predicament in the future, he begs her not to think that she can't do anything. Because after all, everything that he had, he gained it from her. When he let out his first cry in this world, she was the first one who held him. She was the one who taught him about the world when he had shut himself in his room alone. Maria was the one who brought him into the outside world and also, Cyril, Giant, and Geo, his brothers, he found people who were important to him. He was the person he was today because of everything she had done for him. Maria also states that she was proud that she was able to look after him. She could not protect him like Cyril nor could she stand by his side or even support him from behind. When he becomes an adult, she is sure that he will be able to find somewhere to come home on his own. And when that happened, she believed that she would no longer be needed here. However, she promises to defend his honor. If he were to ever stray down the wrong path, she was ready to risk her life to stop him. And if he was falsely accused of a crime, then she would speak out until the end, louder and longer than anyone else. As his first teacher, she takes it up as her first duty. Looking at her eyes, he was once again reminded that she really was the best woman ever. Some time passes, and Gio had also begun his trip to Noto's. As Gian and Ray sat together in the garden, he asks him if he was feeling lonely now without Gio, and he answers that they both were indeed always together, so it did feel a bit strange. But he was not as lonely as he thought he would be. Ray was quite surprised, and he jokingly says that he would make Gio cry with what he just said, and Gian tells him that what he just said would be more shocking to him because surprisingly, Gio tends to make himself look cool, especially whenever he was in front of him. They continue to joke around, saying that he was certainly cool, but he was more cute than anything, and if he were to hear that, he would probably be super depressed. But putting that all aside, he then asks him where was he going. He tells him not to hide since he already knew that he was planning to leave the palace too. And Gio questions him if he was really that easy to understand, to which he replies that he had watched him the most out of all their brothers. So of course, he understood him well. So, getting back to the point, he once again asks him where he was going. And he simply says anywhere. Since Ray had been talking about whether or not to become a commoner, he thought that he would pretend to be one too. And Raymond was just shocked, and he questioned him if he was going to do so without even going to the academy. Gian tells him that of course, he was planning to wait until his social debut. And even though he would only be 17, he could not wait any longer than that. Ray also understood that well. Gian was not an idiot, and he had also realized that he, his younger brother, was protecting him. He was vaguely aware of what sort of effect his existence would likely cause in the future. So, he then asks him what he was going to do about his eye color since green eyes were the symbol of the royal family, so they would stand out. And Gian replies that he was thinking of becoming a blind painter, which was a terrible plan. Ray tells him that there's no way he could travel alone for the first time while keeping his eyes closed. So Gian then asks him to think of a spell that could hide his eyes while still allowing him to see what was around him. And even though it was very unreasonable, Ray says that he would do his best to think of one. He began to hate his brother complex because if it meant that he would be able to see Gian smile, he was ready to take a little bit of trouble. Gian then confirms from him if he was thinking about enrolling in the night department at the academy, 
and he says yes, so he further states that he could form a party with other students at the academy. The academy had something called the party system where they could form parties of around five people to see if they could put what they have learned into practice. He himself was not cut out for fighting, so when he were to go outside for traveling, he was planning on making a request for bodyguards at an academy branch office. So if Ray joined a party, he asks him if he could accept his bodyguard mission, and he responds that of course he could but he could not understand why. So, Giant explains to him that if he made him his bodyguard and go visit Gio in Noto's, he wanted to see the surprise on Gio's face. And Ray also agreed that that would be the best. Some time has passed, and one day, Maria comes up to him and informs him that he has received some tea party invitations, and he gets all annoyed. Ever since the day he provoked General Balsher, people from every faction had begun investigating him even more. The nobles who heard their conversation had grown desperate, and they have been trying to make contact with him. He started ripping the invitations, murmuring that adults sure were troublesome. Just then, Cyril knocks on his door and informs him that the number of people passing through this eastern corridor has increased a lot lately, and even if he was inside his room, he was never alone. So he asks him to be careful, and he understands that. He then inquires if he was going on a mission, and Cyril answers that he was. It seemed there were some fellows in the military who wanted to keep him far away from this, so he would return after he had settled this matter. Ray tells him not to push himself too hard and get hurt, and he responds that he won't. However, since he required a bodyguard to protect him from the people who were trying to use him, he was ready to create an excuse to take care of it. He leaves the room, and then Raymond asks Maria if he has made a mistake. Calling Cyril his right-hand man and his last line of defense, he wondered if it would have been better if he had not said that. All he wanted was to just live a normal life spending time with his family. But all this stuff about political battles and power struggles really was outside his realm of expertise. Maria says to him that she does not understand difficult things. However, at the very least, she believes that it was good to have such conversations beforehand. If he had not told her this, she was sure that when such a time arrived, she would only lament her powerlessness. She also knew that Cyril would feel the same way too because after all, they had no idea how fearsome this power struggle was. Ray responds that if they had known, they probably would have come up with a better plan than he did. And she says that perhaps they would have, but in reality, she had not even begun considering such things. Right now, she was the only one who could understand Cyril's feeling the most, and it was extremely aggravating for her. She, who knew nothing, allowed him to make such a decision, and Cyril, who allowed him, the one who he serves, to hear the brunt of it. They hated themselves more than anything and were frustrated with themselves. Therefore, she requests him to allow them some time and wait as both Cyril and she needed some time to sort through this anger that had nowhere to go. Ray also thinks that he probably needed some time to sort through his own emotions too. And so, he says thanks to Maria. Just then, someone barges into his room, and the man introduces himself as Cosimo Bossa, the one who would be taking Cyril's place as his bodyguard. Raymond, on the other hand, just stood there all confused. So Cosimo once again explains that he was assigned to be his bodyguard while Cyril was gone. But then Maria steps in between and starts staring at him. He recognizes her and states that he looked forward to working with her as they both would be protecting him. However, she questions him if he was Count Boss's son while saying to him that even if he does not serve the Grimaldi family, he was the daughter of a duke, and his rudeness had gone a bit too far. Cosimo asks for forgiveness as he gets down on one knee and kisses her hand in an attempt to impress her. But Maria, beyond pissed, tries to control her urge to kill. He then asks her if he could greet Raymond too, and she tells him to leave at once since he, who did not know even the most basic etiquette, could not even wish to exchange words with the prince of this country. He again apologizes to her and says that it was such an honor to be a bodyguard for a member of the royal family that he let his excitement get the better of him. However, he needed to stay in this room in order to protect him as his bodyguard. Therefore, he requests from her to at least let him greet him. Raymond, on the other hand, tells Maria that they should contact General Balsher at once since he was in charge of the military, and they could have him take responsibility for this. He brings out a blade and with pure killing intent, he says to her that if his hand was bothering her, he could chop it off for her. Cosimo freaks out, and he quickly lets go of her hand. As the bothersome constraint had been removed, they both still decide to go and inform General Balsher, but he stops them and tells them that it was his responsibility, so he would be the one to leave the room. He believed that if Raymond were to leave his room right now, he would be an easy target for the nobles, and Cyril had told him that he should never leave the room, so he left the room instead. 
The moment he left, they both finally got to relax a bit, and he expresses how he could not stand seeing him touch her like that as he did not want her to become the wife of a guy like that. And she also says that she does not want to entrust him to a man like that. But putting that all aside, he suddenly asks her to promise him one thing, and that is, if he ever tried to force her to give up on something for whatever reason, she should abandon him without hesitation because after all, her happiness was his happiness. Later at night, the scene shifts to Leandra's household where her father had just put her to sleep, and just as he left her room, a man Jerzen reports back to him. Balsher asks him how Raymond was, and Jerzen briefs that from what he could see, he was very cautious of his surroundings and he sent away nobles from the Maya faction today as well. The girl from the Grimaldi family who was in charge of looking after Raymond, he guessed that it might be her who was influencing him since her handling of the situation was thorough and it did not seem like Ray would speak to other nobles himself. Hearing the name of the Grimaldi family, Balsha recalls that it was the ducal family that had been declaring their neutrality since Ray was born and depending on which side they fell to, it was no exaggeration to say that it could determine the outcome of this faction dispute. The authority of the Grimaldi family, the lineage of Austin Centro, and the strength of master swordsman, Cyril, combining all their power, Balsher wondered what exactly they were planning, and if Ray actually intended to kill all of his brothers to obtain power for himself. He then looks at Jerzen and instructs him to take caution from now on whenever he observes them. He then asks him if he should call him by his alias for now, and Jerzen, who actually turns out to be Casimo, says that he will perfectly play the role of the prodigal son of Bassa, Casimo. Later at night, when Maria was all by herself, someone came up behind her, covering her mouth, and he tells her how he had longed to meet her and then makes her fall unconscious. Meanwhile, in the middle of the night, when Raymond called for Maria, she did not answer, and right then, he immediately understood that something had happened to her. The next day, Cosimo barges into his room like he always does and greets him in the morning. However, today there was complete silence in the room, which he found very odd since normally Raymond and Maria would be up by now. Just then, he hears some noise from the bed, so he takes out his sword and removes the blanket to see what was under it. But it was actually Ray in there, and seeing him, he immediately apologizes to him and puts his sword back. He asks him if something has happened today and also where Maria was. Ray tells him that she did not come today. For seven years, ever since he was born, nothing like this had happened even once, and Maria had never abandoned her job as his caretaker. She was of marriageable age and she could have been going out and having fun with her friends or starting a family. But even so, she always prioritized him, and he knew that she would never take a day off without informing him. Therefore, he concludes that she may have been kidnapped. He looks at Bossa and says that he should repay her kindness, and for that, they were forming a united front to search for her. Bossa, on the other hand, was still confused, and he asks him how he knows that she has been kidnapped as it could be possible that she just happened to be late. But, he responds that Maria had devoted her seven years to him, and she got dragged into some troublesome situations because of him. He needed to do everything in his power to protect her. Therefore, he tells him that this was not a request, it was an order, and his answer to that must be yes or understood. So, with a menacing look on his face, he questions him what his answer would be. Bossa, who was completely terrified, says understood. He then orders him to explain the situation to General Balsha right away, and also to call Cyril back immediately. To him, Maria and Cyril were practically his family, and it was no exaggeration to say that they both raised him together. So he warns him that if General Balsha brought this through an error in judgment, then he should prepare himself to be beaten in his place. And Bossa frighteningly says okay. But then he realizes what he just said and judging from that phrasing, he wondered if he had already discovered that he was General Balsher's spy. After getting ready, the first thing Ray wanted to do was to investigate how long it has been since Maria went missing. So he prepares to head out, but then Bossa asks him why he was in such a hurry. She was Duke Grimald's daughter, and if she was harmed, he was sure that the Grimaldi house would take action. So even if she was kidnapped, there was no panic, he believed. In response, he questions him if he was really suggesting that kidnappers would be such reasonable people. And if so, then in that case, the knights must only go up against the well-mannered people. The survival rate of kidnapping cases was dependent on time. If their goal was murder or sexual assault, the survival rate was even lower. So he hoped that it was only a misunderstanding. However, if a group of people who don't think highly of him has kidnapped Maria to threaten him into subordination, then he believes that they have been one step behind their opponent from the moment this incident occurred. 
and therefore they should clearly hurry. Bossa understood his point but he requested him to stay in his room for today, where Cyril could come back to be his bodyguard while he could go and find Maria. Ray agrees to postpone it for today alone but reminds him that if he cannot find her within a day, then he would also intend to act in earnest. He then tells him to escort him to his mother first, and Bossa finally takes a sigh of relief while thinking to himself if he had ever felt this much pressure before whenever he talked to him as Casimo Bossa. He had certainly thought he was wise, but he could not understand just how in the world a seven-year-old kid knew about post-kidnap survival rates. He then takes his hand to escort him to Maya's room, however, the moment he held his hand, he noticed that he was trembling and he was indeed nervous. He was acting brave but was still anxious on the inside. He had thought that he was not very childlike, but in the end, the fact is he was still a child. He started to think that if only this child could rely on Lord Geraldum then he could protect him while not wearing the mask of this false identity, but as Rashid Jerzim. He asks him if he would like to be carried by him, and Ray tells him not to get carried away as it was only for today, making him a bit pissed as he wondered why he could not be a bit cuter. The scene then shifts to Maria, and when she wakes up, she finds herself in a strange room and wonders where she was. She remembered that she was attacked all of a sudden and concluded that this was surely a trap to lure Raymond. She started to think that in the end, she has become his weakness. However, she also believed that he would never abandon her. Even if he were to lose his freedom, as long as she was safe, he would be satisfied. And she was sure that he would also say something like that. That is exactly, she decides that she must escape from here by herself. As she walked around the room, she finds a window from where she might be able to escape but could not reach since it was high above. All of a sudden, a man comes up behind her and questions her what she was doing. He pushes her back on the bed, and when she looks at him, she recognizes that the man was Lord Hoffrey. Hoffrey Cassinelli was the current head of the Cassinelli ducal family and the leading noble of the Maya faction. She asks him for what purpose did he bring her here, and he simply replies that she would surely know that better than anyone. He tells her that there is no need to be so guarded since they were already close enough that there was talk of marriage between them and she says that it should have been broken off. She questions him if he intends to get married to her in order to get close to Raymond and if he would really use such underhanded methods to gain his trust. He answers that indeed, it also has its appeal. However, he gets on top of her and states that what it is that he really wanted from her was for her to bring him pleasure. Back to Raymond, when he reaches his mother's room. He quickly hugs her and thinks that ever since that day when the friction between her and his father was cleared up, she has become especially beautiful. And although she seemed scary until now, she could now show her genuine emotions. Also, the servants who were scared of her before had now grown to like her as well. Cosimo, on the other hand, seeing Ray sitting on her lap, yells that this was a very rare sight that it made him want to call an artist to paint it. He simply reminds him that he was still a seven-year-old child and he should be doing his own job. After all, going to call for Cyril was the one thing that he could do to make the first step in restoring his trust in him, making Bossa very annoyed. But, seeing the look on his face, he backs away and takes his leave while Maya comments that Cyril's replacement was quite free-spirited. However, putting that all aside, she asks Ray if Maria was not with him today. Even though, in his mind, he was sure that she had been kidnapped, he tells her mother that she was taking a day off. Meyer also found it quite strange, so she asks her handmaidens if they know anything about it. But they say that they have not heard anything about it and wondered if she was simply sick. Ray contemplates that he was cautious, thinking that there may be hidden assassins. But from the looks of it, the handmaidens did not seem to have anything to do with it. She did not contact Meyer either so he says to his mother that nothing like this has ever happened. And although he thought her attendants might know something about it, but that was not the case. However, she simply pats him and tells him that she would talk to King Abramo as well because perhaps Maria had a family emergency. He thinks that it would be nice if that were true but if Maria got hurt because of him, he was not sure if he could endure it. Just then, Meyer asks him if she was really that unreliable. She was unable to be honest about her feelings, to the point that she succumbed to jealousy, and was even admonished by her own son. Because of his eyes and hair, she always said he would be the crown prince. Ray answers that even if she had not said it, somebody else would have eventually suggested it. Hearing that, Maya says that he was very kind, just like Abramo, and also assures him that she would protect Maria to the best of her ability to because after all, she sowed the seeds of this conflict. However, Ray tells her she should not push herself since he wanted her to be happy too, which put a nice smile on her face. She then asks him if he wants to be the king 
and he quickly replies that he does not want to, not in the least as he knew that he was not cut out to be the king and Federico would be a better choice. But then she asks him what would he really like to be, and he realizes that he has not decided on anything specific. His brothers each had their own realm of expertise but none of them had tried one thing. So, he wanted to do something in a different field. He explains to her that although it's not like he has his heart set on it, however, he wanted to be an adventurer and wanted to see the world. In the past, Maria told him about the outside world, and that's what sparked his interest in the outside. In a land far to the east, in the steep mountains where the gods dwell, there lived dragons. The tale of dragon knights who bond with those dragons roused excitement in his heart. In that case, his mother suggests to him that she should go and see her homeland. The royalty of the Ost Empire all lived alongside dragons. Since she got married, she did not receive a dragon of her own, but the eldest child who inherits the throne would always be gifted a dragon. If he were to go to Ost and ask them, she was sure they would let her see one. He agrees to do so and at the same time hoped that Maria could also see that one day, and so did Maya. She further tells him to leave the search for Maria to Lord Balsher for today, and instead, they should spend some time talking to each other. Later at night, Cyril finally comes back after he heard that Maria had gone missing, and Ray briefs him that the night's investigation team said she has been missing since last night. First of all, Cyril expresses how glad he was seeing that he was safe and promised that he would be by his side tonight. And secondly, he wanted to have a chat with Bossa regarding Maria the next morning. He then informs the other guards that he would be sufficient enough to guard Raymond and asks them to return back to General Balsher. But they say that Balsher had entrusted his security to them. In response, Cyril bluntly states that their presence would only make it harder for him to protect him. And they try to explain that they won't get in his way when all of a sudden, Cyril points his nail right at one of the guards' throats implying that he could have easily killed him right there. On the battlefield, even a moment's distraction could lead them to their death. Following up on what he just did, he questions them if even one of them could keep up with his movements. The guards remain speechless, and Cyril, on the other hand, with a smile on his face, requests them to join the search for Maria instead and also to gather some information regarding that as he took Raymond back to his room. Later, when they were alone in his room, Cyril asks him if the Maya faction was behind this incident as they expected and Ray answers that it was most likely them, or so he wanted to say. However, he honestly did not know since his mother's handmaidens did not know anything about what happened with Maria. They were the daughter of nobles from the Maya faction, and if something were to happen around him, and the consort faction was involved, they would be the first suspect. So when their parents were planning something, they should have been informed, but they were not. He further asks him how many nobles could go up against Maria's family, the Grimaldi house, and Cyril explains to him that the ducal house of Bernini, the consort's family, and House Balsher, responsible for Centro Kingdom's military but supported Federico as king, House Roval, and House Casinelli, which led the Maya faction, were the ones that supported Raymond as king. And then there was the House Grimaldi, which maintained neutrality. These five families were the five ducal houses of Centro, and the one who kidnapped Maria was definitely one of these nobles. For House Bernini, Bernard knew that he said he wanted to become a commoner, so he doubted that he would do anything like abducting Maria. General Balsher, on the other hand, mobilized a lot of guards for this incident, so he was sure that it was not him, and the Grimaldi house had no reason to kidnap their daughter. So in other words, it was either Roval or Cassinelli. The next morning, Cyril finally meets with Bossa and states that he heard Maria has been kidnapped in his presence. And while intimidating him, he asks him how does he intend to explain this. Bossa was at a loss for words, and just as he was about to speak, Cyril slams the wall next to him and warns him that if anything happened to Maria, he would take his throat and tear it to shreds. Bossa remained terrified, but then Ray tells Cyril to calm down since they could handle his punishment later. And today, he wanted to have a constructive conversation. Cyril agrees but before going anywhere, he lifts him up in his arms and says that he will be the safest here which once again made him think how cool his master was. Meanwhile, Balsher, who was right behind them, comments that they both seemed quite close and then asks what was their business here today. Ray questions him back and states between Casanelli and Roval, which one does he think would kidnap Maria? Balsher inquires why only those two families and he explains that through the process of elimination. He thought that it would be either Casanelli or Rovell because it would be foolish to think the Grimaldis would kidnap their own daughter. And if it was the Berninis, then Federico would have stopped them. And as for the Balsher family, he knew that they would not do anything that would damage their own reputation while also smirkingly confirming from him would they do that. 
Balshir was surprised, and he asks him was it really him who thought of all this. Ray questions him back if it really interests him that much, to which Balshir says yes it does. So, in that case, Ray tells him to hurry and reveal which family was more suspicious. And if he was right, he would answer one question. Balshir states that if it was limited to these two families, then it would be the Casanelli family. He explains to him that the current head of the Casanelli family was Hoffrey Casanelli. That man used Maya's marriage into the Centaur kingdom as an opportunity to force the previous head down from his position. It was also said that he usurped the title of Duke to support Maya. Therefore, if any of them would do something as cruel as kidnapping a woman, it would definitely be him. Hearing all that, Ray clings to Cyril and says that they should hurry over there and save Maria at all costs. Cyril agrees, and he quickly jumps out of the window of the second floor to head towards Hoffrey Casanelli's manor. As they were on their way to rescue Maria, they took a short break as Bossa ran out of breath, and Cyril asked him if he was okay. Pissed, he answered that they suddenly jumped down from the second floor and immediately started running out of the palace at top speed, so it was really tough keeping up with them. Ray then wondered how exactly they would go to the Casanelli Manor and realized that they don't even have a plan. Bossa told them that it was a long way to the Casanelli Manor, so they should either take a carriage or use teleportation magic. However, magic was not really his forte, and Cyril also stated that he did not have much magic either. If they had gone through the standard procedure at the palace, they might have been able to borrow a carriage, so Bossa questioned why they just jumped out of the window. Ray said that it just kind of happened because he felt that they needed to leave immediately. They then asked him where they were right now, and he explained that they were outside of the palace and gardens where Raymond normally stays. There was the personnel building, and inside the personnel building, there were the military quarters and training grounds. Right now, they were outside of the front gate, which was past the personnel building. Raymond was surprised that Cyril carried him out of such a heavily guarded place such as the military quarters, and he responded that he had done nothing that would alert them, so he could rest assured. Also, if he ever wanted to escape the palace, he told him that he can get him out anytime he wants, while Bossa reminded him that that would cause a lot of trouble for them to deal with the consequences, so he requested him to refrain from that. He decided to go and speak to the guards to borrow some horses and beg them not to move from this spot under any circumstances. While they waited for him, Cyril brought out a cloak and gave that to him, saying that he prepared this some time ago since his black hair and green eyes stood out as a symbol of royalty. Ray also noticed that Cyril was not wearing his usual plate armor today, so he asked him why, and he answered that it would be cold if he were to carry him with his armor on, leaving Raymond once again completely amazed. Meanwhile, Bossa returned with the horses and asked if they could go now if the two of them were done dallying. They finally headed out, and since the Centro Kingdom was located at the center of the world, the royal palace was in the center of the noble district, outside of which was the commoner's district, forming a circular city. Right now, they were heading towards the eastern noble's district, and Ray understood that this was the place he had always seen outside his window, the world outside the palace. After a while, Cyril decided to leave the horses because the mansion they were going to was only a bit farther now and they would stand out on horses so they would be walking from there. Bossa decided to stay there and take care of the horses. He looked at Ray, and even though it went without saying, he asked if he was going to get Maria back, and in response, he nodded. Cyril, on the other hand, told him that if anything happened, he would entrust him to him, so he should be prepared to run at any moment. If it came to that, he was determined to guard the rear. Having said that, they wondered how shall they enter Casanelli Manor since they originally thought they could simply force their way in. But Bossa, who remained shocked, questioned them if they were really thinking of making a frontal assault against someone who might have kidnapped Maria, and Ray laughingly replied that it would be fine. Even though it may not seem like it, he also understood his own value as he thought to himself that Maria's kidnapping was almost definitely related to him. And if that was the case, they would not kill her if they were using her as a hostage to lure him in. If refusing to listen to them would cause Maria to get hurt, then he was prepared to obey, no matter how humiliating it was. In any case, if they could just determine that Maria was indeed inside Casanelli Manor, then he believed that they could leave the rest to General Balsher. So just as he was about to say something to Cyril, he simply responded, I refuse. Even though he did not say anything, he could more or less infer it since he had been watching over him since he was born after all. Ray says to him that it would be a problem if he does not agree, and he also knows that he won't be killed. If Cyril was on his own, he was sure that he would be able to bring her back no matter how many guards there were. So he requested him to give Maria priority because he won't be able to act freely while she was held hostage. Cyril agrees to follow his plan, however. He tells him that he would not leave him behind. 
he promises to get Maria out carrying him in his arms and would protect both him and her. Therefore, he requests him to stop this habit of giving up on himself. In front of the main gate, there were two guards on lookout, and Ray walked up to them. Seeing a lost child there, they ask him what business he has in Casanelli Manor, but he remains silent. Then all of a sudden, Cyril takes out one of them while Ray tells the other one that he should not look away. Cyril knocks the other one out as well. After laying them down by a tree, he wondered what would they do if it turns out Casanelli was not involved, and Cyril simply responds that in that case, he would lecture them for their lack of vigilance. They decided to go inside, and when they knocked on the door, a person from inside questioned who they were. Ray inquires if Hoffrey was there in the manor right now, and the person asks what was their business with him. Annoyed, he tells him to quit his nitpicking and inform Hoffrey that Raymond was here to see him. Suddenly, the man opens the door, and he was shocked to see that it truly was him who had come there. Looking at his black hair, which was as beautiful as velvet, and green eyes sparkling like polished gemstones, he was amazed to see that it was Raymond himself. Without any delay, he offers to guide them both to Hoffrey. As they walk through the corridor, he states that Hoffrey would surely make time for the two of them. Even though right now, he was most likely speaking with his fiancée, Maria. Hearing that Maria and Hoffrey were both here in this manner, he started to believe that this was most likely a trap, just as he expected. The man further says that he heard Maria had been studying etiquette at the palace for seven years, and Hoffrey was eager to hear about Raymond, so he welcomed her to the manor just the other day. He asks him if he was acquainted with Maria as well, and he answers that he knows her very well. However, he could not help but feel something strange about all this. Cyril then introduces himself to the man, and he also introduces himself as Sergio, Hoffrey's attendant. Cyril noticed that his hair was gray, so he asks him if he was from the Ost Empire since the people of Centro had bright hair, so it was rare around there. Sergio explains that although he was born in Centro, somehow he was born with this hair color. When he was a child, it made him an outcast. However, Hoffrey took a liking to his hair color and took him in. Hearing that he took in someone who was persecuted, Ray started to think that even though Balsher said that Hoffrey was dangerous, things could look surprisingly different depending on one's perspective. He then leads them to an underground bunker where Maria and Hoffrey currently were, and he immediately takes it back since anyone who would imprison Maria in a basement was bound to have a nasty personality. As they finally arrived in front of the door, he hoped for Maria to be okay. When they opened the door, Hoffrey was asking Maria what happened when Raymond used magic for the first time and how did he react, and she told him that he was absolutely adorable. When he made a feather float all by himself, he was so overjoyed that those jewel-like eyes of his sparkled even brighter. He truly was the definition of adorable. Just hearing that, Hoffrey fell to the ground and started rolling like a fangirl, yelling that Raymond was wonderful, and they must have a painting of him done immediately, while Ray and Cyril just stood there confused. Maria then says that she really wanted to get going soon, and he tells her that she has been by Raymond's side all this time. So until she tells him every last detail about him, he was not going to let her leave. She just sat there all tired, but then she noticed Ray and Cyril at the door, and he simply creeped out seeing that this man in front of him was Hoffrey. Hoffrey, the current head of House Casanelli, had been scheming to gain power, and for that, he kidnapped Maria to lure him in. He was known as a shady man, or at least that's what he had heard. However, the man in front of him was not at all like that. He couldn't even speak properly, making weird noises. Ray walked up to him and questioned why he kidnapped Maria and why he took her away from him. However, Hoffrey, on the other hand, began to cry and said that he could die happily now. Just like that, he fell to the ground. Ray looked at Maria and asked her if Hoffrey did anything to her. She explained that it seemed like he just wanted to talk about him, and because of that, he was not allowing her to return. He wondered why he was so interested in him in the first place. Sergio told him that Hoffrey was actually in love with his mother, Maya. Ray immediately replied that he should be castrated. Sergio further explained that even Hoffrey himself did not expect to take actions, but he thought that he had to do everything for Maya. If it was for her, he had devoted his power, wealth, and everything else to her. Cyril commented that it sounded like an insane stalker, and Sergio completely agreed. However, he was devoted to Hoffrey, who was devoted to him and Maya. In other words, every servant in House Casanelli would serve him and Maya the same as Hoffrey. Their flesh, blood, and even their hair belonged to both of them. Ray, on the other hand, thought to himself that he had seen crazy people like these before, known as obsessed Odakas. After understanding the situation, he woke Hoffrey up and asked him if he liked him and his mom, to which he passionately answered that he did. So Ray then asked him if he would listen to everything that he said from now on, and Hoffrey got a bit scared. 
He explained that he would have to come the moment he calls for him, stand there, and wait for his signal. If he were to tell him to bring anything, he would have to bring that to him and not do anything unnecessary, only obeying his instructions. If he could do that, as his reward, he was ready to make time for him. So, he asked him if he was ready to become his dog, without skipping a beat. Hoffrey yelled yes. If it was for him, he was ready to do anything and everything, and Ray thought to himself that he was indeed scary. However, considering the future, he needed more people like Cyril and Maria on his side, people that would follow him unconditionally. Having said that, he told him that he would have to be of use to him right away. Later, when they returned to Bossa, he questioned them about why Hoffrey was with them and tied up with a collar too. Ray asked him if he had a greeting for Bossa and Hoffrey introduced himself as Hoffrey Casinelli, or they may also call him Raymond's loyal dog. Ray explained that he was actually someone he knew, it's just that his dog was a bit disobedient this time, and nothing really happened to Maria. Bossa stated that he had never heard about that, and he replied that he would explain everything when they meet General Balsher. While thinking to himself that he lied about knowing him because Hoffrey would be used in the power struggle later on between Maya and Karina, Bossa could not understand why a loyal dog would kidnap his subordinate, and in fact, calling an adult a dog did not seem right. Hoffrey said that he wanted some attention, so it just happened. He then further inquired if Maria was okay with this, and she also stated that she was since Raymond himself allowed it, but he remained doubtful. So he then asked if that means she was going to marry Hoffrey because if she were to let this pass, not only her reputation but that of Grimaldi Ducal House would suffer. Whatever the reason, she was kidnapped and forced to stay in the Casinelli mansion for a night, and though it was broken off, she and Hoffrey were once engaged. So, in order for Hoffrey to get his hands on her, he even deflowered Maria, is what he believed the rumors would say, and she remained at a loss for words. But then, Hoffrey stepped in and said that he was being a bit too disrespectful towards the Duke's house. He found it very rude that he said he made Raymond his object when in reality, Ray was the one who made him this, and in fact, he admitted that he even asked for it, leaving an awkward silence between them. Ray said to him that was not the part he wanted him to back him up on and Hoffrey apologized to him while he told Bossa that if it comes down to it, he will find a marriage partner for Maria. He promised that he would look after her until the end. However, Bossa argued that in that case, wouldn't she have to give up on a happy marriage since those who would ask for Mary's hand were only aiming for his position. Any other men would just run away. As Maria remained quiet, Cyril stepped in and said to him that his worries were unnecessary. Bossa questioned him if he would marry her, and Cyril simply replied yes, leaving everyone shocked. He turned back and looking at her, he told her that all this time, he has been filled with regrets, and then he heard she was kidnapped. While they have been working for the prince, he always thought that even if they could not be together, he could at least guard her until she found a partner. But he was wrong. It was not empathy nor sympathy, and as he went down on his knee, he confessed that he was in love with her. Since he was formerly a commoner, he understood that she might consider him to be of lowborn origins. However, as long as there was a possibility, no matter how small, he asked her if she could give him some thought. She started to cry, and with that said, he turned back to Bossa and said that if he still had questions regarding this matter, he could freely talk to him because he was not the type of gentleman who stays quiet when someone speaks ill of the woman he loves. Bossa admitted that he could not really say much more about this, and he questioned Ray if he was fine with this, but he, on the other hand, was simply crying tears of joy and could not control his emotions. As they were on their way to head back, Cyril asks Maria if she was uncomfortable even a little bit, and she says that she was fine. He was still a bit concerned leaving Raymond to Cosimo, however, he was still a better choice than Hoffrey, who was just in his own thoughts, thinking that he would never be allowed to touch his smooth, delicate skin. Meanwhile, Ray continued to cry and says that he wanted to live to see Maria and Cyril's children, but their happiness was suffocating. Later, when they arrive back at Balsher's place, he questions Hoffrey if what he means to say is that he kidnapped a lady of House Grimardi, and he admits that he did but he believed that there should not be a problem with that. Balsher reminds him that she serves Raymond and, on top of that, he snuck past him and kidnapped someone, which was foul play. Hoffrey simply replies that there was nothing more important than looking after Ray. Balsher tells him to think about the country at least and asks him if he wants to smear dirt on House of Grimaldi's face. Hoffrey says that he might consider it next time but Ray had already warned him to leave Maria alone. Meanwhile, Ray thought that basically, the story was that they were going to pretend that Hoffrey and he were corresponding, 
but a letter signed by Hoffrey would have been blocked by Maria, so Hoffrey used a pen name to stay anonymous and continued communicating with him secretly, so they'd never met before, never knowing his name or face. Pachai was the name he used when sending letters to him. Hoffrey had been hiding the fact that he knows he had been receiving these letters, and he also kept silent since he did not want to lose a pen pal. So, in order to put an end to this Pachai Hoffrey crisis, they had decided to meet in public, and that covered it. And now with him here was Bossa, sent by General Balsher and the Hoffrey who had been exchanging letters with him. The factions had gathered, and this was the perfect distraction until his brother Gina leaves. He knew that the general must be wondering if all of this was even true, but he was sure that he could not outright deny it when he sees how crazy Hoffrey actually was. Hence, due to lack of evidence, General Balsher agrees to believe Casanelli this time. But coming back to the security, he informs that Casimo would continue watching over Raymond and Cyril would guard both Maria and the prince. He then asks Hoffrey what brought him here today, and he questions Ray what should he say to him. He answers that he could go home now. So, Hoffrey states that he would be returning home for the day, and Balsher wondered why did he even come here then. Hoffrey then takes his leave, even though he wanted to chat with him a bit longer. Looking at him behave like that, General Balsher gets hella annoyed and slams the table, yelling that he had been doing this weird stuff all his life while he had to clean up his messes every time. He looks at Raymond and asks him if he wants to know why he does not believe that man, and before he could respond, he goes on to explain that man toppled his father from his seat and then after the mess he made, can't be bothered were the words he said. He pushed everything onto him instead. He does not even know what a duke's family should be, and even though his predecessor was known as a kind, wonderful person, he did not inherit any of those qualities at all. Ray replies that he would try his best to keep Hoffrey under control from now on, and General Balsher could not believe that a child had to speak up for Hoffrey, as he was also a duke. He wondered if he should feel ashamed or should he be reliable that someone else was there to shoulder it while Ray thought to himself just what in the world did Hoffrey do in the past. Balsher then picks himself up, and since they still had some unfinished business as well, he reminds him that he said he would answer any one of his questions, remembering that he did make a promise like that. He asks what does he want to ask, and General Balsher questions him what does he think about his daughter Lindra, leaving him a bit confused. He tells him that his daughter was extremely interested in him, and if he was amenable, he wanted to make her his fiancé. However, Ray responds that he was the type to marry for love, and because of that, he refrained from any fiancés. So Balsher once again asks him what does he think about Lindra. It was expected that a father would support his daughter in her love life as he begins to remember about the times whenever she talked about him and wanted to become a lady just for him and even wanted to become stronger just to protect him. He requests her if he could at least just meet her, and Raymond tells him that he does not dislike Leandra, but as he was right now, he could not protect her, and he could not take responsibility for anything, so he did not want to meet her. Balsher assures him that he would protect Leandra if anything were to happen, and of course him too. Ray knew that was natural coming from a general, but it would make it harder for him to do anything, so he twists it around and says that he cannot find a reason for him to do that, so he refuses. Balsher admits that he was really stubborn, and he replies that he just had a strong will, so he changes the topic and then questions him if he truly has someone backing him and if he was really communicating with the Maya fan club, with Hoffrey. He asks if he really cannot trust him, and Ray starts to wonder if he was really worried for him or was he just taking advantage of his insecurity to make sure he does not have any enemies. He tells him that even though he trusts him, he still could not rely on him because he still did not know much about him, and that was all. He decides to head back, and since his paperwork had increased because of him, he asks him to take care of that instead. And for Bossa, he instructs him to stay here as well because he did not need a guard who scolds Maria. He says that he should become someone who knows how to treat a lady before he comes back. He had not forgiven him for what he did, and he was not the one who would sit still when someone attacks his people. Because of that, he did not want to speak to him until he had reflected on his actions, and he left. General Balsher inquires what did he do, and he explains that he thought if he made him mad, he would confess what his relationship with Hoffrey was so he stirred things up with Maria. Balsher admits that his habit of not being afraid to offend anyone other than him was an amazing talent in a way, but it turned out to be his weakness this time. Bossa apologizes to him. Balsher assumes that his apology has nothing to do with Raymond's anger, and he proudly replies that it was because he had failed him. 
He tells him to be more careful since he was royalty after all, and Basa agrees to do so. But still, he was the one who saved him, and because of that, he was willing to do anything for him and says that he could use him however he likes. However, Balshar also knew that the only reason he was saying all this now was that he told him to stop causing troubles, and he once again proudly says yes while the general contemplated why there were only unreasonable people around him. He just wanted someone with common sense by his side. Later, while Ray was having a tea party with Giant, he asks Maria and Cyril to join them too. So when they sit together, they both get very awkward, and seeing the two of them like that, Gina immediately understood what was going on, and he congratulates both of them, saying that he had always thought what a great couple the two of them would make. Cyril thanks him and says that he was still waiting for her response though, and Maria also states that she plans on telling him after she had decided. However, she did tell her father about what he said. The kids wondered if that means she accepted the proposal, and Cyril himself was also surprised when suddenly, the two of them decide to go to the next room to give them some privacy. They quickly leave the room, telling them to take their time. Just like he mentioned earlier, Cyril tells her that his heart was with hers and he asks if he may take that as a yes. With a bright smile on her face, she confesses that she does love him. She needed to go and speak with the Duke of Grimaldi soon, and they both decide to talk again after her father grants his permission. While Ray and Gian, who were hearing everything from outside the door, were just overjoyed. The scene switches, and years had passed since then. A little girl was running in the hallways, and she enters a boy's room. She calls out to her big brother Raymond, who had turned 12 now. In the world that he had been reborn into, there existed five major countries and 99 minor countries. The largest school out of all of them, Raymond had finally arrived there. He asks Bertrand if something was wrong since he was continuously staring at him, and he says that he was still not used to that hair color of his yet. However, with this disguise, Ray believed that no one would be able to tell that he was royalty. Bertrand tells him that he would be in the school city, so if he had any problems, he could come to him, but he assures him that it would be fine since he was not a child anymore. He says bye to him and approaches the magical academy where his new life was going to begin. The scene then shifts to one year ago, and he was with two kids. He looks at Maria and Cyril holding a baby in their arms and asks them if that was their third child who was born recently, Aurora, and they confirm that's right. He was 12 now, and after that incident, Maria and his master were finally married, and they had children soon after. Maria lived with an attendant now to help raise the children. The new attendant, Irina Pritsenko, was originally from a count's family in a northern country and by making her his attendant. It was implied diplomatically that she could be his wife, which he did not even want to think about who orchestrated that ruse. The other two kids were named Zenon and Nestor, and as for him, he had a little sister now, Ellie. Maria compliments Alfred that she has become even more adorable, and she returns the compliment by saying that she looks even prettier than before too. Cyril also states that she studies very hard, and even though he almost saw her every day, even he was amazed. She proudly says that she has been working hard every day to become a fine lady, and just seeing how cute all of them kids were, Ray hugs them all. They all sit together to have some tea as this year marked Ray's social debut, and even Gian was very excited. He was going to keep a picture of him, and Andrea even picked out an outfit for him while his father said that the ball would also be his birthday celebration. Lindra of the Balsher family was also going to attend who had once asked him to marry her, and since he was not thinking of engagement at the moment, he did not want to tie her down for life. Maria tells him that she was aware of his concern for those around him, but as she had spoken to Lindra before, she was inclined to root for her as well. Ray responds that if she still likes him when she grows up, he would stop putting off his answer and think about it. Cyril reminds him that he will protect him no matter what because he had his body, his arms, and his weapon to be his sword and shield, and with that, he promises to protect him in everything he wishes to protect. Raymond, as always, could not help but think how cool his master was. Then, the scene shifts to a girl who was in the middle of her sword training. Her hands were covered in bruises, and then, Balsher comes up to her and says that they should end their training there since she needed to prepare for the ball tonight. The girl was, in fact, his daughter, Lindra. Later at night, as all the guests started entering the royal palace, a man looked forward to meeting his nephew Raymond, the son of Abramo and Maya. He knew him well from Maya's letters but had not seen him since the time he was born and also wanted to invite him to his Ost Empire. He asks his son Wilhelm if he was not excited to meet his cousin too. Meanwhile, Ray was finally ready for his social debut. However, he felt very depressed thinking about the partner dancing. But once the ball was over, he could finally leave the palace and enter the magic school. Just then, Giant comes up to him and wishes him a happy 12th birthday. 
he gives him his present, a purple Anteros, and explains to him that each color of Anteros had a different meaning in flower language. The red one he gave him when they were little meant I will always love you, and this purple one meant flawless beauty. He tells him that he looked even cooler today. Then, Gio also joins them, and looking at both of them together, Ray thought to himself that they were beautiful even as children. Those two carried the elf blood, so they were beautiful beyond measure, and as they grew up, they became even more beautiful. No matter how much he dresses up, he knew that he was no match for them. Gio says to Giant he should not tease him anymore, however, Giant just could not hold his excitement since his little brother was making his social debut. Gio apologizes to him on his behalf, and Ray says that it was fine and also welcomes him back from the United Kingdom of Notos. Gio had a birthday present for him too, and he gives him an earring. He made it, but Giant was the one who designed it since he was not much of a designer himself. So, he asks Giant to put it on Ray for him, and since it was a present from both Giant and Gio, he tells them that he would treasure it for life. They explained to him that whenever he wanted to take it off, he could just touch his hand to it and say the incantation A.E.S.H., and he thanks both of them for the gift. Having said that, they decide to get going, otherwise, their father was going to get tired of waiting. And so, the three of them head to the ball. All the girls were head over heels for Raymond, and everyone wanted to dance with him. As he thought to himself that this was going to be harder than he expected, a girl comes up and says that they were all bothering Raymond. If all they wanted to do was argue, she tells them they may do so somewhere else, and Ray recognizes the girl that was in front of him was none other than Lindra herself. Lindra greets him and asks if he remembers her, and he says, of course, he does, which puts a big smile on her face. She apologizes since the others had caused him such trouble, and he tells her that there was no need for her to apologize for it. Though she says that as the daughter of a duke, she needed to be a role model for everyone else, and if these women were causing trouble, then it was her responsibility as well. He notices that she was actually embarrassed, which he actually finds very adorable as she looked just like a little kid. Now that they had met again, he takes her hand and asks her if she would like to dance with him, and she happily replies, of course she would. They both share a dance, and during that, he asks her if she would be enrolling in the academy as well and she says yes, so he then tells her that he was not good with parties, so the next time they meet, it will be at the academy. With her around, he believed that it was going to be more fun than he thought, and she starts blushing hard. He takes his leave while thinking about his smile, she says that he should not be allowed to be so charming. Ray, on the other hand, was just glad that he somehow managed it since he had to dance at least one song at the ball. But then, Andrea comes up to him and teases him that he sure was popular with the ladies even though he was still a kid. He tells him that the outfit looked good on him, and Ray responds that the clothes he chooses for him always looked good. Andrea was glad to hear that but then he notices his earrings which had a dragon gem on it, and Ray tells him that it was from Giant and Geo. Andrea explains to him that in flower language, a dragon gem means you are my sunshine, and especially since Giant was worried about his health and Geo was worried about not being able to use magic. He was sure that to them, he was like the sun itself. To express that he liked it, he kisses him on the forehead, and Ray starts to think that he was very pretentious. If he were to do that to a girl, he was sure she would get the wrong idea. He wondered why were all his siblings so kind and good-looking. If they were to become hosts, he believed they would all be number one. Andrea tells him that he does not do that with just anyone but only to the people he chooses. He decides to get going while all the ladies continued screaming for him. But then, all of a sudden, Orlando also comes up to him, and together with there was a girl who asks him if this was the youngest brother he mentioned earlier. He introduces him to Francisca, who was soon going to be his wife, and Ray politely greets himself to her. She expresses how adorable he was, and Ray then asks Orlando if he was going to greet their father today. With a big smile all over his face, he says yes. Even Francisca points out that he was smiling a bit too much, but then he tells her that he was really happy that he could tell everyone Fran was his, and she tries to get him together while Ray thinks that it was like Orlando was the maiden and Francisca was the handsome boyfriend here. So he just congratulates them both. Orlando then brings up how he said he wanted to be an adventurer, and he informs him that he would be the king of the Occident's kingdom after he marries Francisca, even though she would be the one doing most of the work. He believed that he would be able to help him out. So, when he enrolls in the academy, if he were to decide to study abroad, he tells him that he should come and see them as they would be waiting for him, and he says to them that he would love to meet them both there. But then seeing the look on his face, they both could not resist saying how adorable he was. He somehow manages to escape from them and was beyond embarrassed when all of a sudden, 
His father comes and picks him up while asking if he was enjoying the party. He tells him yes, he has gotten heavier and how he used to be so little in his arms. He then asks him how is he and how are things between him and his mother, and he briefs him that they had not spoken as much lately since she had been busy taking care of his sister and she started talking to other people again. It made him feel a bit lonely but he was glad his mother changed. His father says to him that Maya was a passionate person, and even if she was spending less time talking to him, he reminds him that she still loves him. He hoped that he, his mother, and Alfred were all happy together. His father continues to tease him since he was blushing a little, but he then looks at his brothers and asks them for help. However, they simply wish him luck, and he realizes that this was a rite of passage. So, he decides to just go with the flow and hugs his father back. He expresses how happy he was that he, his mother, and all his brothers love him so much, and he tells him that he loves him too and thanks him for everything. Hearing that, he gets very emotional and yells that his son was an angel. 